So, welcome back to the NRC Grind. My name is Peter Howard at PA Howdy on Twitter and threads and everywhere else you need. And that we go live every Wednesday. It's Wednesday, right? Yeah, Wednesday at 9.30, we talk about Dynasty Fantasy Football, Fantasy Football in general, really anything you drop in the little comment box or whatever streaming platform you happen to be listening to us on. We're watching. This is a watching type platform, that's all. Um, so you know what's annoying? I was reading Cole, uh, Kevin Coleman's article about how to build a better franchise. And I think in a lot of it parallels what we talk about in the Dynasty grind in terms of timing being more important than player evaluation. And player evaluation, while it's really important and really interesting and the stuff we enjoy, there are so many people throwing so much of that particular well that it's quite often better to back up and build or at least play Dynasty through a wider perspective or something he was calling the macro. It's like there's a lot of parallels here to the stuff we talk about, timing being better doing player evaluation, but being willing to back up and just recognize where similar trends happen and take advantage of things that are very obvious, obvious things that commonly happen and we should expect to happen, but we often miss that forest for the sake of examining individual trees and trying to decide who's the next unexpected outlier, like a Puka Nakua or who's the next James Robinson drafted further down in the draft that has a top 12 running back season. So just trying to avoid and getting too down deep down into those weeds and doing better player evaluation, but not throwing exponentially um, um, more of your capital, your time or energy, um, your genius, obviously. at that process can actually have outsized beneficial results. And I was like, yeah, we're doing it right then. We're, we're applying a lot of stuff Kevin's talking about. And then something, like every now and again, a good player does well at the Combine, and those that spend infinitely more resources trying to do better at player evaluation but suck at it so hard that they're paying attention to the Combine just get lucky and end up liking Xavier Worthy. And, you know, that, that sucks. Hey, Zach, how you doing? Not too bad. F fear not, Peter. Fear not, because what was it, what will happen with Xavier Worthy is you're going to have people who, who came over and liked him because he ran fast. We're going to run by that <laughs> mark. People are going to say he ran too fast, and they're going to and fast. they're going to say the only the only people who ran that fast to be drafted in the first round are John Ross and and all of these people who failed and so there's no way xavier worthy can do it because he's just a speed guy and so then we'll still be here uh in the xavier worthy camp because he's actually a good receiver not just a speed guy like speed is a tool in his belt but not necessarily his primary weapon which is really fun I for a guy who just ran the fastest time ever at the combine <laughs> For speed not to be uh, his, his primary weapon. No, I think our only hope is if the BMI truthers like face off against the combine truthers in some sort of street battle, like on Anchorman, <laughs> and everyone just perishes, not dies, <laughs> obviously, because we're talking uh, metaphorically here, but just like gives up on fantasy football because the battle is too hard, and then we'll be left in peace. I think that's Out the only hope. Outhouse killed a guy with a tri. Yeah, <laughs> so, that escalated rather too quickly, if you ask me. Um, but no, speaking of disappointments from this year's class, running back, how are you doing? How are you doing on the running back evaluation for 2024? Oh man, the the yeah, it so and we knew this, but the running back class starts um where like Zach Charbonnet was last year. Like that's the that's yeah. the top of this running back class. Like it's it's not great. Um, it, it's it's fine. We uh, we have our first set of running back uh, the the first six running backs tomorrow night with the the dynasty dummies hoot nanny and J Mike and I have been kind of talking back and forth about who we're who we're watching for that. Well, we've already watched who we have watched for tomorrow and who we need to to have on the docket for next Thursday because I was like, look, I don't think there are 12 running backs that I'm interested in having watched 13. And I know that I'm not interested in, in most of the 13 that I've watched. 
So we've been trying to come up with who we're watching for the the second six. And then I guess if if um anybody out there is is listening to us or watching us do the hoot and nanny and, and we do the the 12 running backs that we're doing and you want somebody else to like yeah let us know but holy cow it's it's the, so there's going to be some value at running back because because everybody's oh, that's talking some like, good players but, yeah because yeah, everybody's talking like i am yeah but but it's also like i don't think i'm taking a running back in the first round of this like of this rookie draft like like the first 12 picks it's really close to not taking running backs well it depends because my ranks are going to be different than adp but i think after you get outside the first seven eight players in this class i'm like i can see me preferring a running back here but you're right one of my seven is probably going to be drafted after the first running back so i've got you know i've mean? got i've got five receivers that are that are in clear tiers above the running backs i've got whatever there are for quarterback so so three or four okay so now you're at eight or nine and then bowers is 10 so maybe at like 111 112 depending on you know landing spot right. and that sort of thing like maybe but like holy cow like i don't remember the last class i mean 2000 was it 2019 was not very good with running backs, but that, but that one still had Josh Jacobs. It still had Montgomery. It still had, uh, Miles Sanders. So they were still like running backs that we were like quasi interested in, not, not at the level of like Saquon or Bijan or CMC. And that David way. Montgomery and Sanders. So yeah. Uh, and Jacobs, I can't, Jacobs was in there. Don't get me wrong, but he didn't turn up particularly well for me. Not yeah. that that means much, but I wouldn't have been overly excited pre-draft kind of a thing. Daryl Henderson, I remember being pretty big that year. Yeah, Daryl Henderson for nerds, yeah. for nerds, not true. Yeah, that, like stuff. like the the, the tape on Daryl Henderson was you could drive two Mack trucks through the holes that he was running through. So yeah, 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 yeah that kind of thing. That that sounds like something someone would say. Uh, yeah, Toronto Dave. How many potty hey, hat Dave. guys can we really stand? Appreciate it, Dave. <laughs> BC Troller is laughing. That's pretty cool. Uh, Todd Rainmaker, what is Bryce Young's value in terms of top 2024 draft picks? I like the fact that you give us a scale. That's helpful. In a 12-team super blitz. Um, yeah, he's outside the top five picks for me, but he, he, yeah, sixth would be the lowest I'd possibly go. He's a quarterback. Um, I was going to say when I just read like the first part before I clicked on it, and I think of him like Kirk Cousins for a less productive fantasy team. That's about where he's valued, you know, uh, quarterback 16 to 14 or so. I have him a yeah. little higher than that because I think there's value in hoping that potential hits in a few games and then suddenly he's more tradable for a young player. But his value is probably in and around there. In terms of draft picks, better question, and I wouldn't trade a top five pick for him right now. No, and I, I'd be I'd be probably starting to think about it at like the 108. And and maybe you can't get that done. I don't know. Um, but that but that's kind of what I would be doing is is that that area. Definitely not a top five. I mean, I think that I think that yeah. it's pretty clear that there are uh there's a re-roll at quarterback potentially in this in this a class. Couple, and yeah. and like so Bryce Young's value is – he's a buy right now to me because I think you can get him for less than what he's worth. But by the same token, if he does not do something this year, you're not going to be able to get anything for him next year. So I, it's – or not much. Uh, yeah. He's definitely a points proposition, but the value upside is there. And he really yeah. only needs to show out a little bit, enough to get the hopes up. I've been thinking yep. about that because every year we get the questions in Superflex. Do I take the wide receiver one or do you take quarterback? And it's really about the class and the players because we do do a little bit of evaluation. But in general, yeah, you just take the quarterback. Um, and I've been thinking about that. I was using Bryce Young as an example at the end of the season. It's like Bryce Young's had the most disappointing rookie season for a while um, that we expected to be good. I thought Bryce Young was pretty good. Um, and JSN had an okay, mediocre season. 
like who would who's higher valued right now and right now it's bryce young uh, and the other corollary is like stroud versus i'd say puka but that's a little unfair stroud versus addison good great rookie seasons um and, and all along the chain, the quarterback wins a year out in Dynasty. But there is inherent risk. If the quarterback struggles, he holds better value. But you have to start making that choice whether you want to take the points proposition because he has to do something in these next few games. You were talking about him on the Superflex Super Show um, with uh, John. Um, I, I don't believe the things Peter Howard says. Uh, <laughs> oh, I believe his name is. Um, <laughs> my mortal enemy. Uh, I can't remember exactly what you were saying, but you were essentially saying he was misused, miscast by the Panthers in terms of what he does well. Is that well, accurate? For his own not, play? not not necessarily misused, but what he like his big flaw, like like if you were gonna if you were gonna figure out how to beat Bryce Young, it's get pressure up the middle, and the Panthers' mm. offensive line is absolute dog spit, and so to get you know, for for him to to lack the ability to account for pressure up the middle, and for their offensive line to basically be turnstiles, really put him in a position to fail. So, like, he's not a he's not uh, necessarily like a creative, out of pocket, you know, off platform guy. He's a he can move the pocket a little bit, but he's much better in in the pocket and without pressure up the middle so uh, again it was so my my evaluations last year for young and and stroud came out like a, it was a coin flip like i'm like yeah. it's half a, it was half literally half a point and so i'm like look i think bryce young is really good i think cj stroud is really good my my write-up on stroud was everybody is laundry scouting and that's dumb it doesn't matter what shirt he wears, he's going to be good. And my write-up on uh, Young was he is very short, but he has been short through his whole career. And we were excited about him when we didn't know exactly that. how short. Yeah. And so, again, I think they're both good quarterbacks. It's easier for me to say C.J. Stroud will be a good quarterback at the NFL level because he has already been fantastic. But I, I don't see why young at the cost of you know once you're once you're out of the first top draft picks, I, I think that I was gonna say my quarterback evaluation process is still uh, um but I did start a little bit last year and all I know is I had Strad one. The fact that they're the same <laughs> tier and I would have agreed with everything that you just said means nothing. But I was just reading my Richard Anthony Richardson right up, and I was I was feeling myself, I guess, a little bit because it just says no. <laughs> yes, the man rushes, but he's worse at passing than Kellen Mond at twenty percent below the accuracy of Drew Locke. It goes on, but I I I, I, I I'm still out uh, uh, based on that. Um, <laughs> but but again, <laughs> like it, yeah, like, um, the 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 young bet is Fields. I was out after Fields' rookie year, but I'm going to play the value game a little bit. And if Fields suddenly starts scoring more points than his actual passing improvement that the NFL really justifies, it's mostly touchdown based. And then you get these value windows. So it's really about where you're going in on the upside of what his tradeability would be. Like I, but based on performance wise, yeah, I'm kind of kind of kind of disappointed. I, uh, so. Yeah, if it's well valued, I'm on the out. Uh, Toronto Day says crumb season, which Corum. we agree yes. with, right? Yes, oh, I am. Corum. Day, I prefer Day. saying crumb because of uh, Harry Potter. I think there's a player, there's a character. Yeah, Victor. Crumb. Victor. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. but yeah, Corum. Uh, yeah, I think we both have him one. So, I I, I definitely do. Um, he again is a little bit undersized. He ran fine, which again doesn't. Ma like no, that's a, the thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm with you. Like the that was that was my very clever tweet. Was as soon as the combine happened and everyone was like, "Oh, here are my com post combine rankings." And so I took my pre combine rankings and quote tweeted them and said, "Here are my post combine rankings." Because I'll cut out all the evaluation time I need to, and just giving up on the combine's been great. There's no yeah. adjustment. There's no, 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 well, I'm and, good. <laughs> and and the so here's the thing: if if your draft is before the NFL draft, yes, 
use the combine because yeah, the, because the NFL is going to there is going to be weight given to some of the combine numbers by NFL teams. Absolutely. And there are thresholds that you like to you like you don't like to see a running back who runs a 4-7. Like that's not great. Like a, a running back who, by definition, should be able to run and can't, that's not good. But <laughs> if they can't be, run, I'm asking. Yeah, but like being a slower running back versus being a speed, like a like a 4-3 guy, that's not necessarily the the delineation. With with wide receivers, nothing matters because the 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 term wide receiver is antiquated and so I think if you probably if you bucketed uh, types of wide receivers and then went and studied what is valuable for each type of wide receiver, and then when guys come into the league, you bin them by type and then you know evaluate the combine. Maybe mm. that's a lot of work. Like, yeah, and um, well, it's not just a lot of work. I enjoy a lot of work. Um. But no, uh, Connor's on a big. It's context stats, Pete. But I'm like, we've got small buckets, and you're bucketing a yeah. bucket. The minute you split it again, and, and the thing is, I'm not entirely sold by a player who does well at this. I'm still not entirely oh. sure it would work out if the sample what? size was good. I do like your idea, or our idea, of, uh, like players that didn't play against solid competition, presumably yeah. because of conference level. The idea they need to be NFL level athletes is good. And I like that idea, but I think that's always going to be oversold too, because no one's impressed with Adam Thielen's 40 time. So, right. like, even the players who come from, oh, even Cooper Cup was pretty fast, but his overall combine performance, I don't remember really being spectacular. But NFL level, it, it, it's not even an over under. It's just, you know, uh, do they look like regular people like me, or do they look like these athletes that are in the NFL? I, I agree with that to a certain extent, but mostly it's just. Well, but, yeah, but I mean, just, I think, and I was arguing with someone on Twitter the other day who seemed a little obsessed with the idea that I, not obsessed, but he mentioned it several times and they got kind of angry when I asked why. So I, I didn't mean to make him angry. I just, I'm wondering if this is a thing people say. He was saying the NFL doesn't do it just for entertainment. And I was, I don't, maybe they do well, a little bit, but also I don't. It's not that I don't think they think it's valuable. I think the interviews, getting to know these players, getting access to these players, if nothing else, probably gives them a lot of value. And they probably do use the combine. But then you've got the, we're looking for a different thing and, and we can only do so much. Whether it's useful or not, I, how much utility we can extract out of it for fantasy is a big fat zero outside of who's the NFL is going to draft. Like you were saying, pre-draft. Yeah. It's got a lot of insight. Just who they invite, just to make yes. a list of players, is infinitely is really valuable at this time of year. But if you're going to draft after the NFL draft, I think the utility of it falls away pretty much to zero. Well, well yeah, because that's and it's funny because when everyone says don't double count the combine and people are getting mad, well, people are getting mad because they're tweeting out like combine stuff and they're like i'm not double counting the combine this is me counting the combine i'm like if you take draft capital into uh, your equation that's yeah that's now, where you now suddenly, you have double, yeah. yeah now you have double count you combine. have <laughs> so, but but what i'm saying is back again back to the wide receivers and the the different types of wide receivers cooper cup ran a four six two he is slow he is slow there you go. yeah i, I okay. didn't think it was particularly but, good but his three cone was 6.75, which means his quick change of direction, which is matters to the type of receiver he is, was ridiculous. Like a seven is is where you want to be under. He was he was a quarter second under that. So like you sit there and go, oh, that type of and the same thing with Jarvis Landry. Jarvis Landry ran like a four, it was almost a four seven. It was like a four six four or something that was slower than Cooper Cup, but his three cone was ridiculous. Again, that type of wide receiver is just different, and and so and and I think and to yeah. to Toronto Dave's point, we'll, and we'll get down there in a minute, but like it, it's relevant now. The ga game speed clears, like eventually we're going to get to the point where the 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 game speed, the tracking, the GPS that that they've got on all the players all the time will 
be available readily. And then yeah. the combine numbers won't matter because a guy sitting there in a sprinter stance, stance running 40 yards is totally different than a wide receiver coming in motion and then, you know, going out and running a 15 yard route. Like the, the functional speed is different. The, the play speed is different. And so there are some guys that play fast that can't get up to speed quickly uh, in, in the context of a 40 yard dash. So like, and it's I, not, I just it's, wanted to reapply my asterisk there, though. Like the pro, the pro, the problem is always going to be when you say something like that about Cooper Cup is someone's going to think they can therefore look for that signal, and that's just the Cup signal. Well, it's not that no. it's not true, but there are other ways of being excellent at what he does without necessarily being excellent at the three cone. Like to your game game speed analogy, it can be different. But and but I think I think those they're are the, just that, not good utility numbers for us. They're but to me, like, uh, to me, to yeah. me, Peter, that's the difference in the types of receivers. Like mm -hmm. because like, you know we talked. But that's about what that. I'm saying. Yeah, I, I still don't. Even if we had managed to bucket them effectively, I still don't think the combine is going to show you. It's going to put Cup towards the top of the list, but I think there's going to be a lot of misses around him as well. If you know what oh, I mean, it's not going to help you. There out will be. There will be, but I think you can get closer than what. Like right now, there's no signal to anything for wide receiver. Like there's well, not. Yeah, if you just are desperate to make the combine more yeah. relevant. Yeah, but again, I think the simple answer is here. Not to hop on team tape for a second is you know you know that. Over. like if you're I'm looking for that guess. kind of analysis, you're looking for honestly how well do they play? Watch <laughs> if that's yeah. what you're trying to do. Like it, it, your brain is capable even without knowing the words of making better assessments at a lot of that stuff, which the scouts are already doing the teams are going to do before they draft and like you're trying to create something worse version of something a worse a much worse version of something that exists just by looking at the draft or in fact looking at the interest from teams in at the combine who do they take interviews with who do they have interviews with and um, who's whose agent is talking about there's buzz around this player who's rumored to be going in the third all of that is better than literally devoting your life trying to eat out a little bit of signal from the combine let's just, just quit it's good with yeah. fantasy football players we're spending way too much time away from our own families as it is for this stuff and the end goal is it will have relevance that you can dismiss the minute the draft happens so i don't know it's yeah. worth devoting my life to it um yeah. or getting a degree in statistics um <laughs> just so say um fantasy care says kickers uh, unfortunately, StreamYard doesn't have an easy block button, but I'll get back to you and do that. Uh, for sure. <laughs> no, I have no problem with kickers. Um, Tommy Blair. Uh, which position group is most likely to beat uh, base rates in this rookie class? That's what you mean by base rates? I would say in that's going to be a rates? new question. Uh, I mean, the, uh, yeah. the wide receiver class is good. <laughs> yeah, um, wide receivers tend to, for fantasy, have uh, outside effect you're wanting it to especially so the base rates are pretty good if you're talking about hit rates or relevant most base rates i could think of would be how impactful they are for fantasy and i think there's at least two or three that get multiple fantasy relevant seasons over the first couple of years so it's always pretty good and um, this is actually something i wanted to go into especially because of the way i define hit rates rather than base rates and um, 2014 is technically a low wide receiver hit year because those guys didn't hit the top 24. They hit the top 36 a little bit and they didn't hit the top 12 a lot. They actually did most of their damage in terms of my hit rates in year two. And I think people misunderstand that because once you define and come up with a consistent definition of hit rates, you've got to readjust to what is good and what is bad, if you know what I mean. Um, but that's a separate conversation in general. I don't have a clear answer for this because I'm not, I'm, I think I'd be talking outside of, like, I don't know what you mean by the question. I think I could answer it, but I don't know. I think uh, in terms of impact in the NFL, like Zach said, it's going to be quarterbacks, going to be um, going to be wide receiver in this draft class. So it's not a strong running back difference making year, but there are definitely some players that are that always come up. They're going to be highly relevant. You shouldn't dismiss the position, but you should be expected you should expect to spend less of your draft capital on it than usual. Um, and tight end, despite having read Kevin Cole's uh, article on how how willing we should be to spend less draft capital on tight end, I, I think this is a year to 
at least go in on the one, the, the one tight end. For the first time, in, and I wasn't entirely in on it. Like, I had Kyle Pitts ranked lower than most, but still in the first round, and I think you gave him crap for it because yeah, it's dubious. I think this is a year I'm not scared to spend. Like, that fifth pick, for me, in my order, don't know what the actual ADP is going to be yet. It's a Brock Bowers pick. Like, I don't want to take him lower than that. I could be talked into taking him higher than that if everyone else gets higher. Like, that's where I'm at with Brock Bowers. And um, so I, that's probably something in this conversation. But again, I'm just kind of talking about ideas. Sorry, Tommy. Uh, Toronto Dave, he diddle diddles, then pressure up the middle. I don't think you want me doing that. Uh, it sounds like you're saying crumb. Yeah, I am, literally, because I'm saying it wrong, to be fair. <laughs> And clear. Uh, 4.7 jogging back, no good. Uh, yeah, I mean, no. I mean, there are thresholds. Even Travis May, who's much better at most things than me, talked about how there are limits to where players shouldn't be beyond. But I think once we've run out the timeline of the earth here, almost all those thresholds will have been beaten once or twice. And it's the same with the BMI and the weight thing. Like, we've never seen a player be productive in the NFL lower than this line. And then that player does it. So we've never seen a player be productive lower than this line. And then another player does it. And it just, like, I've only been here a little while, five or six years. But every year, those thresholds seem to change, weirdly. And it's because there's another player that's out. And it's because those things don't have actionable effect on the result. The point is, if they're getting drafted with this draft capital, that's where you should value them. And their size is kind of irrelevant to it. Um. I think we mostly give into it because it makes sense cognitively. It's very intuitive until you think about it just a, a, a bit longer. Like, if you're bigger, you get hurt less. That makes sense, apart from when you restrict the group size to players that have been actively playing football since they were eight years old. That's a very different built kind of class. And then they've elevated so far in the game that they're being considered to be drafted at the NFL level. Their body chemistry is a little bit different than mine. Or to put it another way, I'm 6'2", over 200 pounds. Do you want me taking a hit, or do you think I take a hit better than Tutu Atwell? I'll wait. I promise you he takes a hit better than me. The size is irrelevant, especially when you consider the group you're talking about, especially when they're drafted. Um, and it's the same with the 40 time. Every example you come up with, like Arian Foster was worse than that, by the way. Uh, and he's one of the best running backs. He's my favorite running back. Um, but there's always a story. Oh, he was sick the day before. Sure, 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 buddy. It, it's okay to not be happy with a bad time. That's fine. But don't rest too much on it, especially if you get significant draft capital, which Aaron Foster did not. Undrafted, by the way. Um, so, yeah, it's, what did you used to say? Um, you used to say it's a box ticking exercise. They do or they don't, but it's not going to change your rank. And yeah, it's fine to have caution with a bad time or a bad combine, but it, largely there's no utility for us in it at all, except for the fun, getting C players play. Or if you're a tape evaluator, yeah, you probably could get a little something out of watching one drill or another. But then you talk to someone like Zach and he's like, well, they're not wearing pads and the gauntlet drill doesn't actively reflect this or that. And I don't know because I don't watch tape. But like even in that, there's some ambiguity to how much you can eke out of it. I think it's valuable to the NFL. It clearly is because they do it. Um, and if nothing else, those interviews and access to players clearly has value to the NFL because they keep doing it. So I'm not even dismissing the combine. I don't even care if it's just an entertainment product. They are an entertainment organization. They will be fulfilling their operational <laughs> goals if it was for entertainment. But I don't think it entirely is either. It's just from our perspective, can this make me better at drafting or mean that I can be more accurate at getting more players right when I make rookie picks? As far as I can tell, for me, maybe you get something from watching it or you get a good feeling about numbers and where they sit in the spectrum when they're on the combine. I can find nothing that helps me. Zero utility, whether they have a large 40 time or a small 40 time. In fact, the best signal I can find is the worse they do at the combine, the more likely they are to hit. What, what do I do with that? <laughs> <laughs> not, I don't believe that's true. I think more athleticism is good. So, yeah, I, I think it's largely ineffective. But highly but, useful, interesting, entertaining. Sure. But it also goes back to, and and you and I have had this conversation where I kind of tongue-in-cheek give it the, 
athleticism matters in athletics. And I was like, yeah, but every single one of these players is a top 1% level athlete. <laughs> and so there, there are other yeah. things that they do to separate themselves from each other. Yeah, they just and and, and I, I haven't made a video or a podcast about it this year because I think I'm just done. I don't think anyone wants to think to, to see the perspective I'm coming from. And it's just that pure fantasy utility. They don't hit or miss yeah. at a greater or lesser rate, no matter what threshold you want to use. And I've done it for each of the thresholds everyone's come up with. So what good is the threshold? If you don't hit at a like if you're not in a better hit group, just accepting you're gonna get 30% of it wrong. And it hits at 70% versus 30% in the lower threshold. Then I would say, oh, there's some utility. At least you're fishing in a richer pond. It's not a richer pond. It's the exact same pond with the exact same chances of getting a hit. So what? And that's before you get to the complication. I don't think people fully, I don't think I fully understand how you can combine different groups. Like you're in a better hit rate group for the combine, which you're not, by the way. You're clearly not when you use height, weight, 40 times, three cone drill or anything else. You're not. But if you were, how do you combine that with their production numbers or to fantasy cares points, I guess? By the way, we must be getting big. We're talking of fantasy cares right there. Um, <laughs> how do you combine that with some sort of on-field performance metric or how well they did historically compared to past wide receivers? How do you combine the how – do how do I add Apple to, you know – orange penguin i found under my mattress after a night drinking like the, the, the they don't add this together is new math, isn't no it? jigsaw puzzle pieces they don't lock in and so like you just have these two things and the and it sounded like a, people, a lot like i think what we door. do is this is green this is green therefore everything's going green it's like no that might actually be a negative thing it's better to just consider the player as a whole using your brain so i think any model we actually roll out it's going to be it's going to try and fit everything together like a puzzle piece and they're not all puzzle pieces they don't lock in so yeah just a little Rick, common sense but a little to, understanding to, of what every number means or doesn't mean and you're good to answer bob's question though if a wide receiver just hypothetically were to break a combine record like just hypothetically let's say the 40 he would be the wide receiver three in a class, right? That's that's what you would do, Peter. Oh, that's default. Automatically. By default, yeah. no, yeah, no, yeah. but yeah, I'll go with it for the sake of this one potato. But no, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, sure. jogging back. I think that is a position they should actually employ. Why not? <laughs> Isn't that what a fullback is? I don't know. Uh, Alan Davis, our league's move from mm, to sleeper is complete. Oh, congratulations! Sorry, should I pour one happy? out? I'm happy, yeah. but yeah, I'm yeah. I, 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 if I could get everyone to migrate over to Flea Flicker, I would be happier. Uh, but MFL will do. Game speed clears. I mean, maybe, but until it's public, oh, well, I can't even look. It, and I suspect just watching is still going to give you a better understanding. <laughs> but I mean, it would be it would be nice to be able to watch and have game speed. Because you could kind of see what they're a little bit better of what they're doing to win, which is interesting to All me. Right. I don't believe you. Yeah. <laughs> What's your view on Lad McConkey? Uh, gaslit. I feel gaslit, especially after the combine and seeing his goddamn gauntlet like 50 times in a row on my timeline. Apparently, he looks pretty good. That's what good players look like. I wouldn't know. Um, because when I went and looked at his stats, I was expecting something good. The people who like him, like I, I've seen some people whose evaluation I seriously respect. Ray GQ, I think, was the first one who mentioned him. I was like, oh, he's probably going to stand out a little bit. Small white guy, most like, like uh, Elk or, Will, uh, or um, Edelman. Um, but what I found was less than that. Let's see. Um, probably going to be in a minority. Is George's wide receiver one, but he played more like a tight end three? In terms of prospect profiles, well, but he had like the tight the end was, one. There's no one else around, no other wide receiver. He's the wide receiver one, and he's he, he contributes to the offense as much as a decent tight end that marginalizes on a team that marginalizes that position. He's not a huge part of the offense, which is kind of the main signal I'm looking for. Is the team specifically feeding this guy? And is he do are they doing it early? That's even more impressive. Lad McConkey didn't do it, let alone do it early. I think he looks. 
if you look at his yards per route run and a lot of his ancillary numbers, I can see he's a good player. He's just not what I chase for lots of fantasy production. He's not drawing targets, not driving targets, not the centerpiece of an offense, even though it's a relatively small offense. And really, even when you adjust to the type of offense it is, it's just, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. If you get it's drafted, you're probably going to hear his name a little bit. Van Jefferson came up. Not that they play in similar roles, just like that's the level of how productive he was in his own role. Like, it's not like you want to hear his name. I don't expect him to be consistently, persistently uh, a significant part of an NFL offense, but I'd be very happy to hear differently. I mean, his name's Lad. That just sounds fun, <laughs> but <laughs> that's the best I got. Yeah. And, and I think the, the idea of him being a slot receiver is overblown because I think he play I think he See, plays that's what better. I thought. I thought I'd go in and found a guy just like yeah. volume, volume, but not as much yards per route run. Instead, I found the opposite. No volume. Yeah. Pretty he, good yards per route run. He, <laughs> he play he plays better from the outside. He, he plays better down the field. He's, he's very good against zone. Like, and and again, yeah. that's something that I like. Excellent player. So, so as a as a wide receiver two or a wide receiver three on an NFL team, like he has the the requisite skill set to be successful. But to me, it's really hard to see a a way for him to be really fantasy successful. Because like, and that's the thing. Like I was, because I I'm not just a hat rack. I'm like, okay, I've missed plenty. Where is a guy who is this not a volume guy gone on to be successful? And it's like players like MT. And then when I talk to people that watch film, your specific example was he had a better slant route than like he had a thing that he did better than everyone else. And yeah. so you're looking for that. And I don't find anyone saying that on McConkie. It's not something he excels no. at. That another. A great wide receiver that doesn't particularly feature in an offense can't do that's already in the NFL as a free agent and costs a lot less over time. And but like but, it, you know. it was it was but a, a lot of it is McConkey comped himself to Cooper Cup and Devontae Adams, and people are parroting that. And it's like, look, you can watch them and try to model your game after those players, but those players have two of the top four slant routes that I have ever seen, you know, rounding out the route, rounding out the, the list would be Michael Thomas and Debo Samuel. So it's, it's literally Cooper cup, Devonte Adams, Michael Thomas, Debo Samuel. Like those guys were uncoverable, like on a seven to 12 yard slant. Like you just can't, there's nothing you can do. McConkey is not that McConkey's good. I mean, I'm more for having a high opinion of yourself, but. Yeah. yeah, well, and I, I think he was more I mean, saying just be I careful. Yeah, we can game. hurt ourselves yeah. with comparisons sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just saying, like, Mr. Ladd, just consider would you rather stand next to me or Amari Cooper? Like, you should maybe throw some different names, but you want to look good by comparison. Not bad. It's like it's the reason I talk to John Hogue and you. I don't end up talking to JJ Zacharyson or someone else who's actually good at statistics because I, I want to look okay at least by comparison. Uh, and John uh, does a great job of that for me. Um, <laughs> sorry, I think I got a lot of lag going on. I don't have anything open. I swear. You look good though. Liar. <laughs> I promise you'd stop lying. Um. But yeah, Todd, sorry, that's all I can think of with McConkey. I'm pretty sure he's going to be a good NFL player. I think teams will like him. I think he's got good performance metrics. I don't think he's got what I'm chasing in fantasy, but if different, I'll just... Rayman, draft two. Worthy Mitchell, McConkey, Franklin. Worthy McConkey for me. Uh, Franklin? McConkey. Why is his name not coming? McConkey, McConkey. Who, Adonai Mitchell or Troy Franklin? For for me, it's who for McConkey me. It's, is. I was just looking. At that. Oh, it's Lad. Lad. Oh, McConkey. Lad McConkey. See, you need to say Lad, okay? You need, like, I know it's one word to me at this point. Now it's worthy. Uh, and you said Mitchell, really? No, I said I McConkey. Say Franklin. I'm getting really confused. I think Worthy and Franklin, uh, of the two, those are the two that I think I'm most interested in. I've got uh, Franklin at seven and Worthy at three, and none of the others between them. So, yeah. 
Yeah, turn some things off. Why not? I would I would still take Thanks, Worthy man. and Franklin. I have Worthy at three. I mean Worthy and McConkey. I have Worthy at three, McConkey at seven, Franklin is at eight, and then uh Adonai Mitchell like is down further. He's a Mitchell to me is more of the the vertical separator. And I know he ran fast at the combine in drills and, and people were excited, but like he's still not the arch type that I am looking for. I am in the middle of watching um, Jalen McMillan from Washington. He may end up being above everybody but worthy on this list for me. I don't know. I'm not done, so I, I hesitate to say that. But, like, man, so far, I I have really enjoyed McMillan. Turn some things off. Um, yeah. Mitchell, I've got him ranked down there with some other deep threats by the look of it, and I get how they're interesting to dream on. I've heard good things about him around this process, but he's not, again, he's not co-opting his significance. Section of his offense, and especially when you've got a higher A dot, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed with that. They're harder to hit. They hit a little less often than the volume getters, um, and he didn't inspire confidence based on this team volume relative adjusted production um, with that with that higher a dot or the, that particular role so no i've got him in the teens along with who's that other guy i think people are gonna like keon coleman there's a few there's a lot of high a dot players and keon coleman yeah i've got him pretty much back to back down there in the teens i, I think something i often miss is those players and why the nfl spends draft capital on them is there it is it's a viable skill that's always useful it's a ted jim game role um or take in type player like it's more valuable to an nfl team to have someone that can do that even if it's not accruing a lot of actual receptions or a lot of actual consistent um fantasy points it, like it's a harder to replace skill set if you know what i mean but again i'm just chasing fantasy points so i'm not saying they won't have good careers or be viable nfl players or won't actually have fantasy impact but i don't think they're going to have consistent persistent top 24 top 12 performances from now where i sit but the first year is key to kind of guessing at that. So, yeah. Hollywood Titan, welcome back, man. It feels like it's been a minute. Well, something's going wrong with a counter. It says 315 instead of 15. I don't know what that's about. Uh, the hype on Lad just makes me uh, like Bowers more because if Lad is so good, then why did Bowers dominate so much? That could be a team and scheme fit, but in this case, it's it's not. It's and and to be clear, this is one of the plus signs I think on a top profile like Brian Thomas. While he did sit for a while behind a whole host of other receivers, when it where the room cleared up and he was on the field with neighbors or net, yeah, neighbors, he was really dominant in his particular role. Like Bowers doesn't mean that McConkie can't be impressive on a team relative basis. In the same way that Zach always likes to quote Jacob Rickford, pointing out that three or four player, three or four teams every year produce two top twenty-four wide receivers. Like another good player on your team does not limit your ability to have significant um, team relative volume. Like that's one of the reasons I like it. Like Bowers shouldn't have held Lad's team relative volume back. He could still be good. It's the Odell Beckham and Jarvis Landry. Which one was more impressive? They were both really impressive on the same offense in the same year at the same age. And not only possible, it's what good players will do for fantasy and when they're on the same team. Or for that matter, Chris Olave, Garrett Wilson, and uh, it was Harrison, right? Harrison was uh, came from the same team, Ohio, right? Yeah, and, and JSN, like everybody. Garrett Wilson, JSN. JSN. Uh, wow. Well, and, uh, yeah, and Harrison and um, Jameson Williams for a while, too. Like every everybody was there to the point that you can't find so it probably will happen at some point but you can't find a player that's really excused by his competition for not being dominant and you can find players that are excused by their team or their scheme or their situation robert woods in his later career might be an example of how buffalo really didn't work for him and but that's at the nfl it's not in college even like there's no precedent for players having below average roles on their college teams and being below average on them 
because of the competition they had in the offense. So there is a running back. You could say players are held behind other players because there's fewer running backs on the field, but there's not fewer receivers on the field. And just because another one of them is good. That's the end of our comments. I guess my life the, is really uh, affecting, affecting. The the short answer for me, JC, though, is Brock Bowers is that good. Like Brock Bowers is, at least for me, since right. 2017. Yeah. Again, that's as far back as I can give you, like, the, the grading system that I've got now because it took me a few years to get it dialed in. But since 2017, Brock Bowers has the highest grade of any tight end that I've ever watched. And it's not to say that he will be the best tight end going forward because we've already seen some some really good uh, tight ends come through. I mean Andrews and and Laporta and so and Kittle, but but like Bowers does absolutely everything. And the the fun thing for me, and I know he's undersized, and that's gonna turn some people off. But the fun thing for me watching Bowers film, and I started with watching McConkey, and you'd you'd see Bowers go block and then block. And then the third play, after he after he put a defensive end or a linebacker on his rear end twice in a row, Bowers would chip and then leak out into the you know in, into the secondary and catch the ball and then add like eight, nine, ten yards after the catch. And he would do that reasonably consistently. And so it it just watching Bowers, he's that good. And McCon like McConkie is is good, but don't get it conflated with McConkey being a top end player. To me, this class is with wide receiver, you've got Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors as a clear top. Uh, and, and I know there's been some disagreement about whether Harrison Jr. is, is a clear one. I've got him at one, but it's not as big a gap as as you were led to believe six months ago. Like after watching him, I'm like, there's definitely hmm. Malik Neighbors is very talented. They're both top ten players out of the out of the all of the players I've watched since 2017. Then I think for me, there is a fairly clear tier two with. Xavier Worthy, Brian Thomas Jr., and Romo Dunze. And then once you get beyond that tier of wide receivers, it is kind of dealer's choice. There are some receivers that I really enjoy, but McConkie being in that dealer's choice uh, range, like don't get that conflated that like Bowers was, was eating Malik Neighbors' lunch or somebody like that, but – by the same token, Bowers was definitely the focal point in that offense, and he should have been because he is a fantastic tight end. He still um he comes under players like Ingram, Andrews, um, even Kyle Pitts, because my bottle, again, knowing what numbers do, specifically targets how much of a receiver they are. And he's a really significant receiver, but he's also more of a tight end, which I think broadly is actually a better sign than an Ingram or a Kyle Pitts because we're looking for a Gronkowski ultimately, not another Ingram and a Pitts. So, like, yeah, I, I think Bowers probably should be towards the top of that list. And he kind of does come out there as long as you know what um, my model's trying to say, at least. Um, where we get to? Rayman, half point PPR, Taylor Hill uh, and the 109 of Jefferson. Jefferson. Jonathan Taylor, Tyree Kill on the 109. That's probably pretty even, actually. But I, I on nine seventy percent of teams, I probably prefer Jefferson. Yeah, I think so too. I think I mean, obviously, points wise, like if you're playing for this for this season, and, and you've yeah. got a fairly That's and you've got I mean. a fairly young team, the the Hill Taylor side is going to score you more points, but in in dynasty and in, in that like the frame of mind it's jefferson because he will score you points he's a he's a positional difference maker at at wide receiver and also young enough that he holds value further where like taylor probably doesn't hold much value very long uh beyond now tyreek hill has some value, but you've already started to see him kind of descend in ADP. Not that he hasn't descended in production. He's been amazing. 
Like he was the wide but their receiver value one from this year. point forward is just going to yeah keep the forward. the so so again it's you're you're kind of thinking and and I talk about this fairly often but to me there are three different types of value so there is points value and that's usually you're thinking about that more in season uh, rain man where you're it's the the actual literal value of what your what your players are going to score you for points. You've also got the future value, which is kind of the the idea that we can predict the future, which we really can't. But but looking at those players and and projecting out how many years they have left and how many points they have left, that probably favors Jefferson. And then you have like the dream on value, which is like the pick value. But the 109, I don't think you're doing a lot of dreaming on right now. Uh, this is we'll a time get- of year we forget what we just went through in the season, you know, where DFS throws have like infinite amount of struggle trying to predict a single week. And we're like, yeah, but in three years, I can see that this rookie will. I'm like, nah, nah. do you know remember the trouble of start sit last like two months ago? <laughs> we have trouble predicting a week out, but yeah, that's a really good uh, summation. And and that's kind of what I was going for. I like can 70% of teams I prefer Jefferson. I'm 30% of teams, the most competitive teams, the teams that should be expecting a win. And they've got pretty solid value. They're not if they don't win, they still have some still have some draft picks to m- make some moves. Yeah, I, I might prefer the other side if I'm trying to push to win, but it's also really too early in the offseason to make that assessment. You don't know who's gonna yeah. get injured, who's gonna have a running back planted in their lap well this year there aren't many running backs that could do that but what the team's going to look like two weeks before the season is probably the best bet best time to decide whether you're in that 30 percent. not right now but it's probably a pretty fair trade who has better production profile worthy or frank hold on worthy? can i answer this one it's worthy yeah yeah you I, I don't even, i don't I, I don't do numbers but it is it's worthy you are the numbers guy um <laughs> yeah yeah uh, and yeah yeah, uh, Worthy has better numbers than most, except for Harrison and Neighbors. Oh, uh, to go back to that one, Harrison's the one for me as well, but it's the same tier. And the yeah. only concern I can come up with Harrison, and it does not mean he can't miss. He can definitely miss. Um, the, the variance in range of outcome for someone who played in that role in college is a lot wider. You've got Sammy Watkins, who was not as productive, but he still crosses a lot of thresholds when trying to measure it that way. And then you've got it's a Calvin Johnson group, okay? But you also have a, so many misses around them. Not nearly, very few of them are as good or as productive as Harrison was, but it does mean that's in his cohort. You've got a lot of places you could throw that dart and just end up not being quite so happy. In Neighbors' um, range of outcome, almost all are positive, almost all. No, nowhere near all, actually. But, you know, a lot, a larger percentage of those are going to be positive, very few are going to rise up to anywhere near that productive. I would bet on someone as good in college like Neighbors being that productive, but it means the floor's a little safer. He's a little less likely to be nothing versus being everything. Um, but Harrison does have a little squeeze more upside if he hits uh, at that top percentile range of his outcomes. Like that's the difference between them as far as I can see from a profile perspective. Neighbors isn't safer, but I would be more surprised is think i think the way we put it before that neighbors isn't at least good at what he does and that then normally leads to at least some fantasy relevance whereas harrison not being good it happens man you can be just phenomenal at it in college and the nfl is just too big a bite to take but if he is productive like his range of outcomes already starts up here. If you see what I mean, you can't really, again, they're not jigsaw puzzles to fit together, but those that's a difference between them. Um, and so I, I would take the swing on the upside of Harrison. Or if he hits, the upside's definitely there. But that's, a, that's the same difference kind of between JSN and Addison last year. And I was all in on Addison versus JSN. Like Addison was my one. Um, JSN was my one, but I kept pointing out that Addison's who I'm trading up to get because... Frankly, JSN wasn't as productive as Harrison. Whereas this year, the Addison JSN conversation, Harrison yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. He just like, he hit numbers where I'm like, I'm not aiming for the two who I feel pretty good about this year. I probably want Harrison. Um, but I'd be very, very happy to get neighbors. Like I, I'm not, I'm I'm not squeamish about it. 
Yeah, and what and that was blocking like. Good. <laughs> yeah, no, like so Bowers can block from the H back position. He can block from uh, being set in motion or block from inline. He will set edges on on runs. He he just he really is incredibly versatile. Like I I, I kept trying to pick apart, trying to find flaws in his game like the flaw in his game is that he is about an inch and a half two inches undersized and probably 20 pounds but like beyond that he does absolutely everything that you want uh, a tight end to be able to do including blocking and and jc i think that's that's the big thing to me that separates the the really high-end wide receivers from the guys who you know, have the the kind of the ebbs and flows, and it's it's not a hundred percent because you have guys like Ingram who is, has been phenomenal and been a top, you know, three, four, five, six wide receiver his whole career. I anticipate Kyle Pitts kind of getting into that Evan Ingram echelon and being that type of player. But for me, one of the things, and it sounds counterintuitive because we don't get points for blocking. But one of the things that I look for in tight ends is the ability to block, and especially in line, because once you get inside the 20, if you have a, a tight end like Kyle Pitts or you have a tight end like Evan Ingram, there's very little chance that he is throwing a block. So all of a sudden, the defense is sitting there. Either you have a, a tight end that's playing decoy or a tight end that is going out as a receiver, whereas Brock Bowers or, I mean, Travis Kelsey does this, uh, Kittle does this, Laporta does this. I mean, just all of the – Mark Andrews does this. If you're inside the 20, you can have them block. You can also have them chip. So, like, like block but not really block and then slip that. So, like, slip screen and be out in the flat. And now all of a sudden you, the defense has to make a decision to account for him because – the the player that is being blocked now either has to try to try to follow the tight end or you're accounting for him with another defender which leaves you shorthanded in your defensive backfield so because of the the blocking tight end in the red zone being such a chess piece they end up scoring more touchdowns i i think than a player that is not necessarily an inline tight end or, or doesn't have the ability to go in and, and block. And so because the tight end position, so much of your scoring is about touchdowns. I mean, that's the, the upper echelon of, of the tight end position. You're looking for either a hundred plus targets or a, a big red zone presence. Both is preferable. And in order to do both, you have to be able to block. You have to be able to be on the field in the red zone, not just as a decoy or as a receiving threat, but with the ability to be disguised as a blocker or the ability to actually block and and set up your you know your running back for a, a touchdown. Well, five minutes for me to talk about what actually is effective at the NFL because I don't know, but it seems <laughs> to me that an awful lot of hay has been made about play action. Like, that seems to be yes. the key to the offensive game plan. And there's a lot of reasons about mismatching and zone sees, hit swivels. I, I don't know. But it seems pretty simple that most of it comes down to time. Like, literally half a second of the defense. Defense is sent out with three or four things to do if they see A, B, C, or D. And if they can't know as much information before the ball is snapped, they buy you half a second where they have to assess, is it a run, is it a pass? And that, at the NFL level, is incredibly like it's the new NFL offense to have increasing yeah. uncertainty before the ball is snapped. And that's what a tight end that can block gives you. It's just half a second. Let's see. It's less, it's less effective, but whoever has to decide to cover the tight end or not, or whether or not they're going to actually have someone covering the tight end can't be made pre-snap. That's just time. It's just time at the NFL level. Microseconds are actually important. I'm attacking a defense, and it's everything the offense is trying to do. So an Ingram and a Pitts, both good, both solid blockers, I would say. They can never block better than, you know, 90% of humans, but it's very different propositions squared up against an NFL defense, whereas if you're a Kittle, a Gronk, a Kelsey, 
that tiny fraction of time can't be saved before the ball is snapped. And really after the ball is snapped, because they can start blocking and then come off it. And even then, when if that's not the game plan, they can come off it because of the way the play is breaking down. And it's time. It's very small microseconds of time. That's what a, a, it's not blocking gets you on the field. It's blocking buys you time pre-snap that another tight end doesn't. And the other the other part of of Bowers where again the 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 blocking benefits, but also the the NFL has shifted a lot toward uh zones and 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 so having a player come from either inline or h back or just split out wide and be able to make that block and like bowers is incredibly effective at finding the soft spots in zone so all zones are cheap and and so in in zones players are playing areas and there has to be a lot of communication because if a, a receiver goes from your area to the next area, the, the defender has to know that he's coming. Bowers is really good at getting in between those areas where there's there's just kind of a gray area hmm. where nobody is covering him. And so you, you can kind of uh, give your quarterback throwing lanes. And again, there's more room for him to operate once he catches the ball. And he's He's exceptional yards after the catch, and this is kind of a Kittle, Laporta type thing where, and and early Kelsey, where like catch the ball and then add yards after the catch, and that's not necessarily a typical tight end uh, feature, but it is that's a skill set. That, Sorry, yeah, yeah, no, but that it's a skill set that Brock Bowers has. It's one of the th- it, it's it's affecting the wide receiver position as well. Like we were yeah. tracking it a couple of years ago, and it was it's the rise of Cooper Cup. It's one of the reasons that I thought Juju was underrated because I thought he might be able to fill something of that between the zone and well, scheme, he did. But a lot of players are taking advantage. Yeah, for a year, and, and I think still think he's effective, but not Cooper Cup effective. Yeah. Um. But yeah, there are still the wide receiver position is taking advantage of it as well, but. Just, that's all I know about the zone thing. Uh, 109 equals Worthy. This is one of the reasons I thought Worthy was interesting. Really excited to draft Worthy anywhere in that range. Like, I yeah. would have been happy to go 107. 106, if you push me real hard. And, and I need you to hear me clearly on this one, because that's what upset me about the combine and the combine time a little bit. And um, he's not top five in this class in a super flex draft. Uh, not, not, never. It doesn't really matter. Well, it doesn't matter what happens in the draft, but it's really hard for me to see a path from getting above the one of. He won't, for me, get above the one of five. But he's going to be in that the very next conversation because of the combine, which probably squeaks him out of where I would have been really excited to grab him. And um, he's going to come after the like after the five. It's it's worthy or it's whoever your favorite wide receiver three is in this year's class. It's Rome. It's whoever. And I was hoping he wasn't exactly at the top of that list. I was hoping he was going to be six to nine. I think yeah. we just lost that, Raymond. I, I think we just lost that. <laughs> I I don't think Maybe we not. did. I hope so, not. I, so but... I, I don't think I don't think so because I think that Romo Dunze is going to be above no, worthy so. in in consensus. I think that you're going to see Bowers come up above worthy in in consensus. And then I think you're going to end up with one of those, probably Brian Thomas, maybe Troy Franklin, maybe Lad McConkey, mm-hmm. that type of player. There's going to be some Keon Coleman sentiment. The fact that that Adonai Mitchell actually did have a good combine may he push him up. Like they're they're going to be people that look at Worthy and say he's just fast. He's, That's he's, what I need, though. I need like yeah. some of those names in, not even above, around Worthy. And I'm like, okay, I've got to, yeah, that, I'll take Worthy over those pretty easily. I worry, like, I don't know. I, I'm terrible at predicting your personal drafts, but in mine, I don't think Worthy's going to slip out. Maybe Rome, because Rome's hype in the scene, as it were, is pretty good. And he's a pretty solid player, to be fair. Like, I, I, I think he's pretty good. But yeah. Ladd and, and Franklin, if they're anywhere in the conversation, then we got a chance, boys. But <laughs> I, I uh, so maybe I'm overestimating, but I think he's I I, I don't know. You, you just need to you just need to set up 
uh, scheduled tweets that just say John Ross <laughs> Roma, with, really with his forty wow. time, and then Henry Ruggs with his forty time, and then you know you just <laughs> that, that's what you need to do. Just uh, but, spot the difference, John Ross, Xavier Worthy yeah. <laughs> every week. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that 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 and, was the funny the funniest thing to me about the whole the Worthy conversation, and especially after he ran the four four two one, was. The, his whole profile was not a speed player, like not not just a speed player anyway. So like watching watching his watching his tape, and then speaking to you, and and understanding that like what I'm seeing and what you're seeing are kind of meshing. Where like yes, he he does he does get deep. He can beat teams with speed, but he also can be used in the short and intermediate game. He's got a really good, which sounds wild for a guy who is, uh, I think he, he measured in at like 5'11 and change and like 165 pounds. But like for a guy who is that size, he has incredible contact balance. Like once he's got the ball, like he has better contact balance than some of the running backs in this class for a guy that size. <laughs> so, so to have that ability, to have the speed, to have the quickness, he just kind of, marries all of it together and and so again the the my my evaluation of him my write-up of, of xavier worthy was survivorship bias it was the planes coming back in in world war ii and yeah. and looking at the 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 bullet holes in the planes that came back and not realizing it pretty that, memorable from my perspective yeah, I was like i know yeah. that story i like that one <laughs> so not not realizing that you needed to be looking at where the bullet holes weren't because those were the planes that came back. Like didn't make we, it back. Yeah. All of the players that didn't make it, they don't play the same way Worthy did, even though they're fast. You know, yes, they're I, airplanes, I, but but they didn't play the same way. Worthy plays similarly to a few players who have that same archetype who made it. I would say, and the reason he's in this, I'm like, oh, it needs to be a few. It's because I got concerns with Worthy. I like Worthy a lot. Oh yeah, a year, maybe, maybe a year and a half ago, like I would have had him in tier one. Like, <laughs> and if that was the case, it really wouldn't matter. He would be flirting with a top five pick and a super flex draft for me, and I would be all in. And the concern for me is not against anything what Zach just said. We both really like him. I think he was playing a very specific role in college when you look at his career, terms of where he was playing on the field. And it's a little weird to convert to the NFL in terms of a lot of players haven't converted into or just found a consistent role to play in the NFL because college and the NFL play a little differently. Over the balance of his career, he had a high A dot and a high slot rate. Not a lot of players have converted that into a successful NFL role that they can succeed at. He was doing really well at that in college, but I would like to understand or have a better idea of the clear path from doing that on balance of the hour of the totality of your career and being productive at it and going to the NFL. We've got two good examples, Donald Mooney and Zay Flowers, who I'm just accepting even though he's only a year in because he, he beat my expectation partly because of this concern. So it's not they can't be good, but that brings up another question. It's converting to the NFL, and he's going to have to be – where he's on the field is going to be different more consistently than what he was doing in college. It's not that he can't succeed with that, but from my macro view, the idiot who doesn't do the simple thing of watching, and like I don't know how his translates because not a lot of have managed to. And not a lot of people being good at this – and then converting is just a red flag to a percentage calculator like myself. But it's not red. It doesn't tank his profile. I put him third, and I feel pretty comfortable with him over everyone else in the class, including Rome, who I like a lot. He's right behind him. Um, but, like, Worthy's better, so it's not red. But it does mean he's not neighbors. He's not Harrison. Yeah. This is someone that I have to get in that next, that next bracket. That's why I'm squeaking in. So here well, I'm telling you a concern that I have and something to think about because I don't have a solution to this. If you watch, you could think, and you do, Zach, and you've talked about this a little bit, which is helpful for me and everyone else, so maybe you'll do it again. But when you're playing the major most of your time or most snaps, most racks you're playing are higher a dot, which is fine, but also higher slot combined, what he was doing in college the most often 
hasn't often translated into an exact role in the NFL. A few players have managed it, and that's good. I have confidence he can find a path to finding a successful role in college, but it's going to be slightly different than what he did in college for the majority of the time. But I'm belabor- I, I'm, I'm lengthening the point here. I'll just shut up and let you explain why it's stupid. But like, there no. is a concern here from a you know a, a, an idiot macro perspective guy like me. Like, not a lot of players have done that. But in no, this I- class, there's only two players I'm more, like that beat him because of that small little thing. But yeah. it does put him in a second thing. And and we're like we're absolutely in lockstep on that, Peter. Like the 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 top tier is clearly uh, Harrison Junior. and Neighbors. Like, and there is a there is a fairly it's not the look alike. I remember. Yeah, there's a there's head. a there's a fairly yeah yeah you got a ways to go. Uh, but there's a fairly. Well, you can start growing tier. some, and that we could do that. <laughs> there's a, there's a fairly big tier break between those top two and Worthy. But I also, again, the, the the next three with with Worthy, Brian Thomas, and uh, Odunze, like I think they are all very, very good. Uh, Matt B just asked if Worthy is a better prospect than Waddle. Kind of similar, like I, to me, the Worthy, the Waddle, the Addison, the Devontae Smith was similar, but a better uh, high point player. So like, it, which is weird to say, Smith being so small, but like Smith at the catch point was ridiculous. But like that, all of those players are a similar arch type. They're not really the traditional slot, drive a ton of targets, but but they got moved in to the slot as NFL players, at least from from my understanding of, of the way this is working. And it wouldn't surprise me to see Xavier Worthy not be a strictly outside guy. I think he wins, I think he wins easier at the NFL level from the slot, although I think he can move outside. And I think you'll see him uh most mostly downfield from the outside and and mostly kind of short intermediate from from the middle so those slants and and let him get yards after the catch because he can do all of that but yeah peter there like there are definitely concerns with with worthy i mean obviously a guy that's that's that size and the way he won in in college with with deep throws there is a concern you know he struggles with being manipulated by physical defenders. Well, hey, we're in the NFL. There are physical defenders all over the place, so it's going to be a matter of getting him kind of matched up. But but again, it's to me similar to the way Jordan Addison played coming out last year. Like not not NFL, but like coming out. That is a similar way to me. That, that Xavier Worthy played and Addison is translated just fine. Uh, the, the other players that we talked about with, with, um, with Tank Dell and Devontae Smith, who were the, the BMI, you know, if BMI truthers were just, it was taboo. You couldn't talk about Devontae Smith. You couldn't talk about Tank Dell. Like those players have succeeded. There's definitely a path to me for Xavier Worthy to succeed. And I, I want to stop belaboring this point because, but I want to answer the Waddle thing when we get to it. Because my write up of him is in, I think it's interesting. It shows my progression in terms of not sucking or sucking less. And um, yeah, I, I keep thinking T.Y. Hilton, but that's from nothing. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not concerned about his size. He's as productive at his role as Addison was at his. Yeah. But again, Addison made the first here because there was no, what's he going to translate as? And what, Worthy doesn't have a lot of comparisons in that regard. That makes him less than, than Addison, but he was as productive relative to his role. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Rayman, assuming Benson and Brooks, who's your running back three? Interestingly enough, um, Benson is my three because we have uh, Corum at one. Um, I don't know where you have Benson, but so I think Corum is the answer you're looking for, Rayman, because he's the other one in the top three for me. Yeah. So Benson is, is my two. Yeah, Coram is one. Benson is my two, and then we're way off the map because we haven't had the draft yet, and this is just pre combine film. And I like I'm being age agnostic. I'm just watching what I see, and so three for me is Ray Davis, uh, out of Kentucky. 
And I like Ray Davis a lot. Yeah, so. he, yeah. he. So uh, I I made this comment to J Mike the other day, and he he laughed for Relative. longer than he probably should have. He was humoring me, but I, I said that he's kind of he's Kenny Gain better. Like you watched Kenny Gainwell coming out of school, and you're like, <laughs> holy cow! Like he's great down the field. I wish he could run between the tackles. And you watch Ray Davis. And he can, he's got enough juice between the tackles that you can see this path to him being a pass catcher plus. But you can also run him out on a wheel route or split him wide and let him take on a corner and he can actually succeed. And so that type of skill set to me is how you score fantasy points. A guy who can carry the ball and catch the ball is becoming increasingly rare in the NFL and no, he's probably not going to come take over a backfield to start, but he should have a pass catching role. And he's that pass catcher plus arch type where he's got the pass catcher role. And then all of a sudden, again, if the, the one, a running back wins an all expenses paid trip to Jamaica for, you know, the last nine games of the season yeah. and, and Ray Davis takes a, a, a share of the carries Man, you've got a situation that is feed. really promising. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I think Corin's probably the name you're listening to. I have uh, the difference for me is David. If David had his performance at a conference against draft capital, yeah, he, he'd be in that conversation. But for me, from where my uh, nearly last sits, I'm like, I don't know. Is that the same as doing it in the? You know, technically, he played in the SEC with Kentucky technically um but i again i don't these teams are made up you can tell me they were facing all the same competition i'll be like oh okay but they're not drafted nearly as often so it's hard for me to make the assessment right. but um I, like davis is like top of the next tier i'm like i'm probably gonna be trying to grab this guy at a certain point when my wide receivers disappear um josh come here josh i say josh come on uh, hey guys somebody sent me a trade offer for debo Shouldn't I be asking for a decent return with Ayuk maybe leaving? I don't think like that in players. Again, I think Ayuk helps Debo. Debo hurts Ayuk be productive. I, I really do think that way. I think losing one or the other actually hurts the other. Even, but, you know, in San Francisco, that's marginal since they also have Kittle. And I think the team's going to be relatively productive even if they lose one. Um, I would just have to ask what the trade is. I can't answer without seeing the trade. I wouldn't factor in maybe I leaving to my Debo valuation. I find Debo a little underranked when I look across the industry, as it were. People like uh, bored with the old Debo, but I still think he has top 12 in his range of outcomes in any given year because he keeps doing that. Um, and so I kind of like buying low up for a team looking for production, a slightly undervalued stealing of potential production. I think Debo kind of fits into that conversation for a team looking to compete rather than more compete more competitive than building and um, and so yeah i would consider um valuing debo better than most but i'd have to see the trade to know if the trade is even to what my valuation is zach i, I talked for yeah. a while longer than i needed to there do you have anything to add to that one? no I, I think you're spot on where debo if you if you have debo rostered the majority of uh people in the community and probably in your leagues have undervalued him uh, again he was a top i don't know whatever 14 or 15 player last year uh, again and and nobody even batted an eye that he that he was if we're talking ppr and so yeah you should get something back in return for him like you should get a but without knowing what you're what you're the offer is and without knowing what you value Debo at, it's hard to kind of give a, a real concrete answer, but like, and the, and Peter's right. Like the IUK leaving yeah. doesn't really change anything in terms of like, I, I don't think that, that Debo all of a sudden uh, assumes all of IUK's touches plus his touches. That's not how that works. He will be Debo again. He'll I think, be if there. anything, Ayuk seemed to benefit from Debo being gone. Yeah, if anything, but even yeah. that's a little. Sad. And so, like, like I expect Debo to be somewhere between wide receiver ten and sixteen or eighteen again next year. Like that's kind of his yeah. range. He's he's a very or he good... plays three games. 
Yeah, yeah, or he is hurt, but like I, I can't tell you that he's gonna, <laughs> but but um so yes, he is a good player. You should get return for him. It will be difficult to get the return you probably should for him because yeah. especially out of season, because people are undervaluing yeah, yeah, yeah. him and he's not scoring points right now, and so you don't have the the points value fresh in people's mind. And uh, to be clear, Josh, that that's part of how I play. Like that doesn't matter. To, like not getting max value doesn't matter to me. If your team really needs to build, I'd be considering trades at lower value because Dewey is someone that is a more of a points proposition. I think he's got more points to proposition than his current value. But if your team isn't looking for that, like considering trades from is a very good idea. But I still need to really evaluate the trade if I would say I would take it or not. But it's a good time to think about it if your team's not terrible, but not top 30%. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, EJD, if a prospect ran track in high school or college, he has a big advantage in the... Uh, I've heard this one before, and it's a fair point. It's it's a Devin chain kind of point. Because, uh, honestly, as a runner, running's what I did. I can't take contact. Actually, I play a lot of sports. But, um, yeah, there's a specific experience uh, actual doing track racing would be an advantage in the 40 despite the fact all these people have spent their entire lives training like it is there it's like talking a, talking to an expert olympian versus talking to someone that's an nfl player both spend all of their lives uh, exercising they might be similarly fast to tyree kill versus well i'm not you saying bolt but you get the idea but one's got experience and that actually does weigh in when you get into that level of output in terms of raw athletic ability i i, I think that's a fair point or it, it's also the same point as if it's different to running pads and not like i think yeah. people miss the nuance there of it, like you could be faster than someone you're slower than because you're better at almost doing it with pads in some weird way because people are weird and highly varied and yeah so yes that is an advantage also most of these players at this point in the evolution of the NFL and the combine do, do specifically train for the 40 yard dash because they know that that's yeah. going to be one of the things that gets, you know, flashed up in lights and, and sent out all over Twitter. And so, especially yes, if is you're a advantage. high prospect, like yeah. Rome's talk to it. Yeah. It, yeah, it is an advantage like they have the, done it. Most of the players you saw have talked to a track coach. <laughs> like they have yeah. tried to. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm going to stop. So, I keep talking to you. No, no, it's all good. So it is an advantage they have done it for sure. But also they're all, or they should. And there's no excuse not to be training for this at this point. You know it's coming. You know when it's coming. I can tell you next year at the end of March, there's going to be the combine. I can tell you probably the top however many 40 wide receivers and, and 20 running backs that, that should be doing this and should be thinking about this as soon as their collegiate season is over, they should be starting to train for that. And, and so it is an advantage, but not as much of an advantage as it probably used to be. Speaking of undervalued, not re reported or accounted for things, like some of the signal that's being caught if there is any in the combine is not the word dedication. That's too high T, but a player that knows the combines coming is like, all right, I should talk to a track coach or as a manager that's invested enough or an agent that's invested enough to set them up with that. Like here's a track coach. He's going to help you run the 40 over the next three months. What you're capturing with a higher performance could also be their surroundings, their environment, their awareness, their something else about the way they plan forward for the fact that they're going to try and do well in the combine versus a player who's like, I'm very good. And maybe he is, but doesn't think about those small steps. Like that's a different kind of a human uh, mentally. And you might be capturing, if you would capture anything with those kind of small elements of their mentality towards preparation rather than their actual speed. So what are we doing here at this point by valuing the combine number, you know? Anyway, I always thought that was interesting. <laughs> um, just to talk, just talk for talking's sake. Is Worthy a better prospect than Waddle? No. I, I'm reading back of my notes on Waddle. 2020, I had a major screw-up. 
I consider it a major screw up. But um, and so I made a made an intent made an intentional effort to get better at listening because I was listening to good people that could help me with it, but I wasn't taking on their information. So in 2021, I started intentionally going back, doing a second look after hearing what other people take, what they said, and trying desperately to actually understand what they're trying to say rather than hearing what I wanted to hear. And Waddle's one of my premier examples because you've got my first sentence is, no, I'm being gaslit. It's basically my Lab McConkie write-up. And then there's a little note that says second write-up and like two paragraphs of notes on what he did if you really dig into his seasons and that there's a limited season here where it's clearly sowing more upside, it still ends in that, I don't know, but if enough film people I trust, something the sentence is, if you go look at my notes, say he's got talent that just wasn't able to come to fruition because of this limited time on the field, I could be talked to coming in. Like that's one of the, one of the ranks I've read over and over again because keeping notes was a good idea and I think that was my next good idea in trying to get better. Because I listen and I read and I honestly do try, but I thought I, I needed to do better understanding what someone was trying to tell me instead of taking away what I could from what they were actually saying, if you know what I mean. And, and Waddle's the one that helped out a little bit, but not enough. And it gets better from there to this year, I hope. And the second part was getting eight on targets, um, but that's a separate conversation. But that's my Waddle write up. You can start, you can see me evolving as my paragraphs. Uh, I like it, but anyway. Um, yeah, I got Waddle really wrong, is the point. His numbers don't shine anywhere near Worthy or, 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 or Addison. But there was some extra context, which I almost caught some side of by trying to intentionally listen rather than hear, or hear rather than listen, whichever way you want to define those words. Rayman, Thomas is more prototypical with more with similar draft capital. I think he goes before Worthy. Brian He's Thomas taller. actually misspoke, but earlier said I had Rome right under Worthy. I don't. I have Brian Thomas. <laughs> And I actually, yeah, Thomas is the other one that maybe he'll fall into that range because everyone's thinking about Worthy's 40 time. I, be, I like Thomas pretty well. Yeah, Brian Thomas had a pretty good 40 also. I mean, it wasn't 4 2 oh, 1, but it was it was pretty fast. <laughs> God damn, combine. Uh, Richard Davis, uh, what is Devon Adams worth for a strong contender more than anyone else? Uh, where he is depth. Better to trade away if so for. All right, uh, this is what I'll say. And um, oh, wait, you've got a second part. Let's do that. Is this relevant? No. Okay. The way I think about this is if you're a strong contender, Devontae Adams is sitting on your roster. Like, I want to keep contending. Adams is definitely a better piece, and you can probably get for his value right now to do that. But you're also talking about how you're trying to hedge. And to me, that means when you look at your team, you're not certain you're top three, you're not certain you should hit the final. And that's fine. Most of us shouldn't be. Most of us are overconfident when we look at our team. So that's that's no shade. Um, and if so, yes, but I don't know when a good time to trade Devontae Adams is outside of him having some good games again. Because his value is too low right now. If you can get into the the range we're talking, if you can get into that range, the six to the nine with Adams, that's too low. For Adams, what he should be valued at. But if you're trying to hedge because you're not that 30% of teams, I'd consider it for right now for Adams. Um, but if you're a contender, no, you should just keep him and try and use his points. He's a really good player. He's not going to stop being good. His fantasy life is just going to end at a certain point, and we really don't know when. And so that's where the hedging comes in. If that matters more, then you're more, you're not in that that very particular situation where you should just go all in on winning. Mm. That's yeah, what I'm I, saying. Zach? And I, I also think that uh, Tom Telesco, within the past couple of weeks, the Raiders GM came out and said, we're not trading Devontae Adams. He's a Raider, which means that you, you, you're not getting any extra value right now from the news cycle. There'll be no trade room. Yeah, yeah, so so I would I would probably, Richard, hang on to Devontae Adams because what you're going to get back for him – is not going to be commensurate with uh, what you're going to get for points, e even if even if you're not necessarily starting him. So, like your roster is fantastic. I mean, obviously Mahomes, Kyler, you got uh, top end running backs. You've got Ceedee Lamb, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase. So, yeah, he's. On either on your bench or starting in a flex over Rashi Rice and and 
one of your tight ends or two, but like that's again, he's kind of insulating your in injury. Like if a running back gets hurt, all of a sudden Devonte Adams is a flex there. If a receiver gets hurt, all of a sudden Devonte Adams is a flex there. And being a flex play, like Devonte Adams rolling in your flex is fantastic. Now, if you can get a a first round pick for him, I guess yeah, probably. But like you're, I don't think you're getting. It matters that it's ten team as well a little bit. Like Adams' upside is a little more a weight towards that. Like you need yeah. studs more in a ten team, and Adams has yep. a, has the potential to be that still. Like I love that. Um, but yeah, Zach's point probably well. Uh, two or two Mahomes, Kyler Purdy, Bajon. Yeah, you're set up. Etn Jacobs, Mixon's fine. Um, what land you should be pretty good. Uh, what other moves should I be looking to make? Hmm, that's a better question. I you mean, you don't have much to do, you're just building value. I could see why your mind went to Adams on that. Um, instead of thinking of picks, so with someone like Adams, I'll try and get in just buy back a couple of years. This is a really good year for third and fourth year wide receivers to have their highest ceiling. And I don't want to get into the why with all because we're running out of time here, but that's something I try and track what types of breakouts are more likely. And in 2024, I think wide receivers that have been in the league three, four, five years, good, but haven't quite hit it yet. And Ayuk is a name that comes up. If that floats your boat, Michael Pittman, really solid. Um, and you could possibly get into those less sexy right now because they're not draft picks, players for an Adams with the right deal. And that buys you back a few years of at least top 24 production. Not Adams ceiling, but this year is a good year to try and target those type of players. That's the best that I can kind of think. Outside of that, you got stars at every starting position, and you're just, do we know who's going to face plant? I don't. <laughs> I can try and guess who's going to be more or less likely to face plant or not, and I don't see any red flags on him. No. And this is, this is the type of team where if I could get into the first round next year, where there, mm -hmm. this next, next year idea. is a, a fairly good running back class, where yes, you got Bijan, yes, you've got ETN, but but Jacobs and Mixon, Zamir White, their like future is pretty nebulous. So being able to kind of replenish your running backs with that 25 class would be something that I would be looking to. You've got three 26 firsts, Richard, and being able to take those, maybe, maybe move them forward, maybe end up like packaging something and moving you know, a little bit this way with your 26 firsts would be a it's really good a idea. Way to go. like building running back would be another way because you always need depth at running back, roster running yeah. backs. And so Rice, Adams, Pitts, McBride, keep them. By all means, keep them. You should keep them. But if I'm fishing with trades, disappointing second year running backs, that's another group we've tried to highlight. Like Roshan Johnson, Tag Bixby, uh, Zach Charbonnet, not expecting the world, but they could really be productive if the chips fell right and if they're as good as we think. So there's a lot of questions, but those are the type of additions I'd be looking at in trades outside of getting into 25, like Zach said, which is a much more direct answer, or trading into a player in the third or fourth wide receiver career year that I said. But like, if you're looking for ads, try to grab one of those disappointing second year running backs, a Roche on a tank, just build that running back room a little bit in terms of types of moves that's something i'd be thinking of but the 25 suggestions a great one i'm going to insert a question here donnie on twitter reached out to us says these were live streaming so get in the chat donnie but and um, he issued a trade and i think it's interesting uh he traded puka nakua away also Condre miller and a third and a second in 24 that's like the 206 so not nothing but not much what he got back was a 25 first, the 103 this year, a 26 first, um, and a 25 second. So really, it's a 103 and a, a first next year and a first year after that. And I think that's great cashing out on Puka values, especially yeah. with the 103 involved. That's what I see in this trade. Like, I hate selling Puka. He's a top to seven dynasty wide receiver. He should be. But the whole benefit to hitting on this really outlierish third round pick that you know, I'm on Ross St. Brown's, 
most teams, especially since you say in the tweet that you're an older team, that's a great idea because you've got a top three pick in this year's this year's draft. Yeah. I think it's a really solid trade. Yeah. Zach. Yeah, I, I, I'm um, with you. And and even it's a it's a one quarterback league. So that changes a little bit, but that still puts you in the neighbors uh Marvin Harrison and look, I'm still putting Brock Bowers up there as a difference maker. Like I think yeah, he yeah. is a positional difference maker. So so you're still up there in in difference maker territory. So that for Puka is at the very worst a, a push, even though your bet with those picks is a little less than the bet with Puka because we already know Puka is good. So maybe maybe you lose just a smidge of value there, but getting the 25 first. Well, you've also yeah, for, for Kendrick Miller, for that's years. a win. Yeah, and, and a 26 first and second is more than a, a, a so yes, I like I think it's a win. It hurts, uh, Donnie, oh, because okay. you're because you're giving up Puka and and Puka Nakua is fantastic. Top 10 wide receiver, uh, and and could be again, you could end up losing this, but I don't think it's a loss, if that makes sense. Well, where like, your squad is yeah. older, you're trying the right thing and even if you yep. lose the trade somehow like um like the three misses you got to pick the following year and a pick in the first round the next yeah. year and that's a whole part of your team it's not that you have to make those picks but you've built in value around the risk of that pick and um, i think solid yeah uh i have to speed up a little bit i guess uh lots of people had suggestions for ray i don't think we have to read them uh, Philip J. Fry, like it. Uh, in a non PPR league, quit, find a PPR league. There you go. That's my answer. Do I draft Marvin Harrison Jr. or a QB at 103? Is it a super flex? Yes. You, it's a, it's a, you draft the quarterback if it's P, any format, especially if it's non PPR. The wide receiver is a little less valuable. So it's definitely the quarterback at 103, but we don't know who the quarterback at 103 is. Is likely to be at this point because the NFL right. draft is really going to have to answer that for us. If it's a Will Levis, I probably just take um, um, uh, Marvin Harrison. To be honest with you, because I don't have strong conviction at quarterback very often, but sometimes I do. But this year, I think the second, third quarterback off the board is going to be more interesting than Marvin Harrison Jr., especially in a non PPR league. Zach, yeah, you're I'm, nodding, I'm so you. I feel this is bad, yeah. man. We got to disagree more often. No, I, I and I, I think uh, again at at quarterback uh, again super flex. It's the quarterbacks are going to be way more valuable in terms of points than a wide receiver. Now, obviously, you have to look at positional value and positional scoring, but the the value of those top three quarterbacks in that league should be uh, higher than. Malik neighbors like I'm I'm you have to like I you don't have to but you have to if that makes sense like it's a 12 team super flex those those <laughs> quarterbacks it, it's it, it's it's either make that make that pick for a quarterback or trade that pick for a haul because you're going to get either Drake May or uh Jaden Daniels I guess maybe Caleb Williams people have cooled on Caleb Williams because he like I know, finger. right? He, he painted his people fingernails. People don't believe and he, me like, when they get, like he, he people don't run. believe me a year yeah. out. Tank for Tua, Caleb Williams is a difference maker. They tell you this a year out, and you're like, okay, but uh, I'd like to hear that in a year. And they're like, no, for sure, man, Caleb Williams is everything. And then a year later, and people are like, so, maybe it's such a JJ McCarthy. I don't know. Like, so right, I just, I, I just finished. Up. I haven't watched the rest of the quarterbacks, but I just finished up watching Caleb Williams, yeah. and. Everybody who is like running around, the sky is falling because he didn't throw at the combine. Like, right? He's he's really good. His offensive line was really bad this past year, and he still made plays when they did block. Now, when they didn't block, when he was pressured, he was happy feet and he was running out of the pocket. And I don't love his ball security when he's trying to move the pocket. Like, I think he gets awfully careless with the ball, but he also when he's not pressured or when he's pressured just enough that he can like 
move the pocket instead of like flee the pocket. He makes some he makes throws that there aren't very many quarterbacks that make consistently and he does them consistently. He does the the escapability out of the pocket and then realizes that everybody thinks he's going to run and so he's got a, a receiver open now and he'll make that throw. Like his ability to improvise and play off platform and he's also like he's great in the pocket but his ability to move the pocket and improvise and allow his receivers to improvise you know like he he waits long enough to let his receivers get open like man he's really good and and he definitely like there are definitely some warts this year where He's not great when pressured, but go look up statistics of quarterbacks being pressured. They're not as good when they're being That's pressured in a clean pocket. Yeah, yeah, as they are with a clean pocket. And he like he does some things, and you're like, check the tape, and make sure it wasn't Patrick Mahomes, make sure it wasn't Aaron Rodgers, make sure <laughs> like he does some he does some things like that, and you're just like, there aren't other quarterbacks. With the ability to, I mean, it's, it's almost like watching a guy, uh, like a jazz musician. Like you know, you've 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 got the you've got the beat and you've got the melody, and then all of a sudden he's like off on <laughs> on a riff, and you're like, wait, 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 what? You that's not how, but no, it is how he plays. That. Yeah, it's it's fun. Nice. So again, to make this really long, uh, Philip, it it. You should probably take the quarterback. Take the quarterback. I agree, Anthony. Um, I didn't quite understand this. How is running back room TD? Uh, I think you might have been talking to Dave here. Oh, yeah. I missed your question, Dave. Sorry. Um, I think you missed like, a random yeah. 25 first. First. It's probably the first, you know, seven times out of 10, but. Walker's fine. We should not be happy to have Walker as a running back 2-3, but the first in general. It's just going to be a little easier to trade to more players more often to do something more exactly that you want than just having Kenneth Walker. Did I miss anyone else? Yeah, there were a few. I'm feeling... I think you ran I'm by. I'm feeling Javian Sanders in the first two rounds. No. Uh, maybe round two. Oh, oh, you mean like in the NFL draft, Rain Man? Like, uh, I don't. So I don't project the NFL draft. Like, I there's not there's not any value for me in it. It's not content that I create. There, are, there are some people who do a much better job of projecting mocks. Like, if you're talking second round of rookie drafts, yeah, I don't see the I don't see the issue with that. I, I think Sanders is. Again, th this is actually a really good tight end class as well. So, yes, you've got Brock Bowers up at the top. You've got you've got Sanders. You Pretty have a, a couple of yeah. You have a couple of combine darlings who kind of popped. Uh, plus, and and Sanders is my two right now. I haven't completely watched everything, but you've got Jaheim Bell, who's probably more of an H back. He's weird. He was a like when I watched Jaheim Bell, it was like Charles Clay. I don't know if you guys are remember back enough to to go back to Charles Clay, but he was a a running back in college. Back that old, yeah, a running. Back. Well, I know you are. I just I don't know people in the in the chat, but he was a running back in college. Ended up in Miami, played H back, ended up in Buffalo. Was was reasonably productive for a stretch of like three or four years. Where like if you didn't take at that point in time, it was like Jimmy Graham. If you didn't have Jimmy Graham, then drafting Charles Clay was a was a good pivot. Uh, it's fine. Like and and again, like Cade Stover is another one that I mean probably is not um, not going to be the athletic specimen that you want as a as a top tier tight end, but he could end up being one of that one of the big kind of proletariat the middle tier tight end so th it's a good class but yes jetavian sanders for me is the second tight end in this class right now i'm still 
processing tight ends. I'll, I'll have a better estimation for you in two weeks, but but yeah. It looks like uh, back in January, um, it's the last time I updated my tight end rank, uh, Sanders was third. I like Brent Cuthy. Cuthy? Yep. I think he's, uh, but they're, they're a tier, the three blocks. I'm right on. Yeah, same tier. Uh, along with Cade Stover, actually. So, yeah. I think the NFL, if we're talking the NFL draft, as I don't predict it either, it's not a thing that benefits me to play fantasy. But um, I think it should generally spend less capital on tight ends outside of a few bowerish outliers. And so I think they could afford to wait to the third, fourth to grab a tight end, especially in this class. But, I mean, I wouldn't be mad about it on account of I play fantasy, not the NFL. So more draft capital is good for him, generally, most of the time. More party hack, guys. Scouts look for winners in the NFL and subtleties. Agents look for track stars. Probably. I, I Well, maybe now, but I, I will tell you that a lot of a lot of scouts are looking for tools. A lot of scouts are looking for the yeah. Well, no, but not even that. But like they're they're looking for like the the raw athleticism, and we can make them a player. Yeah. I mean, it's the the NFL the doesn't seem end. to be though. Yeah, yeah. And the NFL's. I mean, I like the way you describe it. And I haven't finished the latest Dummies episode, but the one before that, you were talking about how. You kind of ran through why there is no time to develop a player. You're on to next week. You have so yeah. much work to do within a week. The idea we're going to sit down and spend some of this week just making sure you know how to run this route. Yeah, yeah. but they but they still but they still do the thing where they're like, whoa, you know, wide receiver go burr, and they draft the fast guy, and it's like, yeah, you don't know. have to do it's that. Like, it's like, like, that's life, man. It's like they told us about college. It's like when you get to college, you have to be able to do the basics because there's no time for us to catch you up on the basics. I know college is slightly different now, which is probably why the the results are worse. Like you, we can't teach you the 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 research techniques you need to go and find the answers. We need you to go find the answers and write the essay in history. Or we can't teach you the times table. We need you to be able to do the calculations to finish this week's assignment. And it's it's the same thing. Like you're meant to be at the NFL level on the basics. So the idea they're going to back up it happens sometimes. I think Tyreek Hill was really beneficial of that. I think the Chiefs took time. It was he was he was an interesting play though because he must they, have though he wasn't on the field enough to learn half of what he needed to learn well, in college. Well, but, but but yeah, and, but they also did a they also did an interesting thing with him where they like bridged him. So like if you yep, watch his. Yep, yep, yep. his his first year was like a hybrid wide receiver running back, like funky. And and then that's what I mean, though. They kind of eased him into it. They and, took and, time to, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, then they, they were did. like, all right, we've got an off season and you're going to come back running routes. And so he took the time in the off seat. Like, but also that's, that's on the player. And that, again, that's part of what I look at when I'm looking at year to year to year is are these players identifying flaws and doing actively doing things to fix them because you can kind of see that through the progression and if they do that is a a, a checkbox because i i see them as being players who are willing to to do that Tyreek Hill thing to to take the off season and learn a new piece and it was one of those it was one of those things so again taking my own like athletic athletic career uh in into account but like when when i was a, a basketball player in high school it was always taking a move or two or some piece so like one year it was a crossover dribble one year it was a jump stop and then the same thing when i played baseball it was learning a new pitch learning or or honing one of the pitches you know making having the ability to cut a fastball one way and then the other and if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to take the time to kind of hone what you're doing as an athlete on your own, that bodes well to me for NFL players where NFL teams don't have the time to do that for you. If you're willing to do that on your own, you have a chance to progress or better chance to progress. Absolutely. 
Um, Anthony, I think this goes to the point that you can take something away from it. I'm not saying that you couldn't, especially if you're watching something. If you adjust yeah. somehow, I don't know how you adjust tape watching. I don't know how you tape watch. Yeah. They are watching a gauntlet drawn on down field. You could definitely take information about a player away from it. You should definitely should do that. I'm just saying the number that comes out of it doesn't go well. And there's not anywhere. there's not even really there's not even really numbers on the gauntlet. Uh, but like, go watch go watch. Cooper Cup's gauntlet, like Cooper Cup had the best gauntlet I have ever seen. Where like he's so smooth, and part of the part of the gauntlet is the showing the ability to hands catch. Part of it is showing the ability to run, you know, because you're supposed to run uh, on the yard line in a straight line and and catch and catch and catch. Part of it is if you watch how if you if a really good receiver and a really good ball tracker has the ability to keep his head level while he's running full speed and making plays. And so like his head's not bouncing up and down. He's here and here. And so there, like, there is some value to that. To me, Anthony, the, like I would a thousand percent rather watch the gauntlet than any other drill for the wide receivers, except for, I do like that three cone for my slot receivers. Like I want to see a sub seven three cone and and beyond that, like I would like the gauntlet shows me more and it's not the end all be all because a lot of those receivers, the gauntlet is not what they do, if that makes sense. So like they're not necessarily that short area quickness type player. The guys who are high point players, the guys who are vertical separators, the guys who are downfield threats are necessarily going to be a little bit behind in a drill like the gauntlet, whereas a player who, and again, McConkie was a more of a downfield guy, but he also did play out of the slot. Did, did have that. Like it, it's a little more geared to that quick separator slot player than it is the, the deep downfield guy, but you also are getting, you know, a lot of information about how quiet their hands are how you know how stable their their uh stride is and that sort of thing so it's it's a nice thing to have but it's certainly not the end all be all how big of a difference maker is tight end when the premium is not point five versus 1.0 i had this question on the discord point. today and i don't think i made my <laughs> yeah right, cool. um my point well enough because someone else came back in and tried to again needle it back towards I don't think people recognize how much you would have to give the majority, the vast majority of tight ends to make the competitive to top 36 scoring wide receivers. It's a lot. The Scott Fishball did it, and they literally had to flood the position with points to the point it was insane, where Kelsey and even Kittle when he was on, Kittle and uh, Ingram this year were incredible difference makers because they had to do that to make the rest somewhat relevant as a flex choice. And one or two, like 1.75, and it's somewhat relevant for the top 12, I guess, but it still barely makes them flexible. But it makes the top tier technically capable of replacing a tight a quarterback in the super flex spot. So it's all relevant, but you really have to get towards 1.75 before you're really even having that effect. 0. 0.5, 1, 1. 1.5. Okay, I, I change nothing. Well, and and so I I guess my mind goes to uh, the premium, the 0. 0.5 versus one. My guess is that's that's like one point PPR and a half point for tight end. So you're at yeah. one and a half, and and then two oh, like that's two full. And maybe I'm wrong on that because if it if it's just a half point and and one point, we kind of shrug at that because most people don't get the the volume. If you get up, like Peter said, 1.75, two-point tight end premium, so, like, receivers are getting one point, tight ends are getting two points, then all of a sudden... Over slightly value. Well, More all value. of a sudden, it's very sneaky because tight ends are undervalued and quarterbacks are overvalued. The, the second tier of the quarterbacks are, are but, yeah. overvalued. And the top tier of tight ends mm -hmm. who go behind the quarterbacks... Don't you roll your eyes at me. 
I win Russ's leagues, Russ's 1.75 premium no, with no, one quarterback. No, we're talking about in season. We're talking about a season. And it's just it's going to needle with the dynasty value of a quarterback. It's still slightly it higher. It doesn't matter. I want to win. The heat rate is significantly lower. But, and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right about what you're saying. Yeah. And and so, like, I will draft, Philip, the, like, I'll draft Kelsey and I'll draft Andrews and I'll draft Kittle. And, and all of a sudden – my flexes, so I have a tight end in my tight end position. I have a tight end in a flex position, and I have a tight end in a super flex position because that tight end is scoring more than Derek Carr, and and so that's how that's how I attack that. In once you get up, it's there's a there's a threshold, and it also depends on how your league values quarterbacks because if people aren't drafting quarterbacks and people are seeing the the tight end premium and tight ends get pushed up, then you have to figure out positional value versus, you know, where you're taking your draft pick, the the acquisition cost. But if you just look at that in a vacuum, that tight end who is going below those, the kind of middle tier quarterback, so after 12, where everyone's all scoring the same thing and it's not very high, those top five tight ends are doing you a lot more good than those quarterbacks that you have to take two rounds earlier. I don't know if they're going to get to publish it because I was late. Um, but I just did the rankings explain season, and that's something that stuck out tier after tier. Like after you get past the quarterbacks, I'm like, and the reason I have three tight ends here and no one else does is because they're all stupid. No, it's because of, of essentially that, like Ingram, especially Kittle and Andrews are starting to fall a little bit because you've got the exciting young guy that goes above him. Like, yeah, they're a little more valuable than they think. But that's more about the position. Those guys, I think, are a little undervalued without a premium. Um, but, yeah, yeah, you're right. I forgot to do the addition. The one would be uh, over my 1.75 threshold. Also, Derek Henry and James Conner, not much behind. Oh, he's answering. So yeah. Awesome. No, that's just uh, do running backs hit a high value bump in a shallow league? 1QB, 18, 12, team. Uh, 8. Start eight, 12 team. And um, for me, what I always look at is the number of teams, but basically, it's basically multiplying that by the number you have to start to create the number that's relevant to how deep uh, to their effectiveness um, in a given league. So there is a balance to how many you start or how many position starts you get versus the size of the league. Um, yeah. Uh, but running back is a. And Thailand have a weird intermix. The very top of the running back are so difference making, but the rest of the top, like the first six, maybe, um, but the latter half of the top 12 is why everyone's been disappointing with Joe Mixon because he's constantly in that mix up and he's not quite the difference maker of that top six, that top five, top three, some years. Um, let me see. Zach, do you have anything? I, don't, I think I have to think about this one. Well, no, and I think that's I think it's it's this it's the same across. It's the the smaller starting requirement makes you want studs. So you you want uh, like obviously better players in your starting lineup, which necessitates that the top tier of running back. So I mean, Christian McCaffrey was was a full hundred points in in PBR ahead of everybody in, in mm -hmm. terms of running backs. So like. Positional difference makers mean more. So it's not just running backs. It's it's positional difference makers. It's the guys who separate themselves out and give you an advantage in a position over everybody in your league. And running backs do that, the top tier running backs, because they're easy-ish to identify because you need to have a player who gets carries and you need to have a player who's going to catch 50 balls. So there is a finite number of, of players that do that. So those players get pushed up. So it's it's McCaffrey, it's Brees Hall, it's Bijan, it's ETN, and that's I mean pretty much it. I guess like Rashad White was pretty good last year. Mostert was pretty good last year, but they're not the guys that I'm pushing up into that that echelon. Saquon's probably in that tier, although he didn't do it last year. Like th those type of players, there are only about six players that can do that. There are only about two that you're comfortable year over year over year so it's like Bijan and Brees Hall for the long-term future 
So those players get pushed up for sure. The middle tier of running back. I was going to say it bifurcates. It, it splits the, the, it harder rather than anything. Yeah, so, so the, the middle tier at running back, Philip, is where you can actually like you, you can actually gain value because you can sit there and trade a player uh, like James Cook. And you can trade him for a player who everyone else thinks is, you know, five tiers below him, who scores the same amount of points, and and you can reap value that way. So it's not that it's not that running back value gets higher. It's that 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 middle class, you if you're if you're smart about the way you attack that middle class there's a lot more mobility for you because people value running backs more. And the way we do rankings where it's linear it lends itself to that. Like people look at a ranking and they're like, Oh, well, uh, Derek Henry is the eighth ranked running back. So he must be that much better than whoever is the 20th ranked running back. And it's not necessarily the case because if, if you, if you look at it in tiers, like that that tier of running back in that middle, like they call it a couple of years ago, like they termed it the dead zone, but like whatever you want to call it, the middle class of running back, like that group, if you're if you're trading the top of that group and getting back the bottom of that group plus value, like plus picks or plus other players that are going to help you you're actually going to be that much further ahead because the other people in your league think running back has a value bump when really it's only about six guys who have a value bump and then everybody else has an artificial value bump based on the fact that we actually we have to rank linearly even though it's not it's like it's really like one two three four five six and then like 20 guys in a tier um, yeah, thanks. I'm having trouble putting that all together. The only things I would add um, is one, essentially the, the lesser, the fewer number of teams or the fewer number of starters, the more essential studs become over, over middle-tier scorers. That's part of what Zach was saying. Well, I want to emphasize it at the beginning. And the other part about running back is the potential for running back to go from down here to up here is larger at running back than any other position like to go from outside of the top 36 to inside the top five that year that happens at running back fairly commonly actually happens every year and um, and so that yeah the top tiers get an overvalue but these guys down here like zach was saying drawing imaginary lines actually have slightly more value so it's bifurcating value and i would say outside of the dead zone like the top 24 running backs the most overvalued in dynasty in general but below that, they all still have this potential to escalate, elevate, because they're an elevator. Eh, I combined it with your content straight away. <laughs> and so they actually gain more valuable, even though they're less valuable in a weird kind of way. The other slight wrinkle on the studs duds type league, um, we'll call it, I guess, is that wide receiver is infinitely more stable. There's infinitely more flexible players at that position, which some people think devalues it, and I'm not so sure. Um, but it does mean that a larger majority of them have a smaller difference-making potential because you just have those guys at the top and then an even bigger middle tier that Zach's talking about at running back, they're all chop and change pretty steady. But again, those few, because they are not underranked because Dynasty is obsessed with them, they're not going to fall outside the top 36 very often, unlike at running back because running backs come from nowhere. It's like RB3 that no, only a few people knew his name is suddenly a top 12. Whereas wide receivers, most come from within the th top 36, which means taking shots in that group, hoping they get up there, actually makes more sense than doing it running back. So wide receivers less valuable. There's less positional difference makers. Right? Actually, there's about the same number, and we know who they are almost as well as running back. But there's more throughout that middle tier that could elevate. Whereas running backs usually come from nowhere or they come from the top of the fold. There's top 24, that middle tier in between the dead zone. Not always. There's still a percentage that hit. But a much it's a much smaller percentage of those who suddenly become difference makers. So your value is moving in several different directions. Essentially what I'm saying with same Philip. And the simple version is studs and duds it. Always when that restriction happens. Lower league size, lower number of starters. And the positional tier groups get more or less 
that and see we need another word of value more or less interesting to actually target and spend roster spots on because of the ability and where they commonly come from to enter that positional difference tiering that you need for that kind of league that wasn't too that wasn't that wasn't short at all but it is a tldr that i have for you uh anthony yeah uh, take the first by <laughs> running back in season that yeah that's yeah that's probably a better way of saying it uh raymond no rookie draft what? yeah that was that was oh, the right. um yeah maybe maybe Sand no that was that was sanders yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and what i'd say is i typically target running back in thailand after a certain point but there is a strong point at which i'm xana stick by my ranks and this year it's wide receiver pretty heavy so rayman in the late uh, sanders in the late second that's probably as far as i'd push a tight end that's not brock bowers but maybe um, and the draft could bring some changes. Like Zach says, it's an interesting year for tight ends, so some teams might take some shots, make them immediately more interesting. Yeah, it's yeah. a good running back, yeah. And, yeah, always take – like, if you if there's ever a question who to take, usually go towards a running back in a running back uh, in a rookie draft outside of someone that you feel very – like, I want I want to go get worthy. Or if your guy's like McConkey, take my like McConkey. But once your guys have gone, just running back tight end, yeah. running back, uh, maybe a quarterback. Tie goes to the runner. Yep. And wide, depth wide receivers and rookie drafts, there Unless you're me for the first three years of my dynasty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember Charles Clay. I think, yeah. I don't think we're not that old. He wasn't that long ago, was he? Theo Johnson tight yes, end. Yes, speaking of athletic tight ends, yes. Party never stops. So at some point it's stopping. I gotta go to bed, but I appreciate the sentiment, Dave. Party more party hat. We get party hat guys from Anthony now. You spoil us, seriously. <laughs> Owners do not uh do that, not scouts. I think you might I, have a clearer point there because owners are more likely to not be, you know actual players or scouts or like they're they're watching the combine like the rest of us going oh the fast guy maybe uh, uh, <laughs> who, who are all the, who are all the guys sitting there with stopwatches at the combine yeah i mean like yeah owners do that too but like man they they're all because again it's the athletic athleticism matters in athletics so they're they're all trying to find the guys who are because they're about 15 guys in a draft that are obvious, right? There are. And then everybody else is either trying to find somebody that they can dream on with some trait. And the obvious traits are speed, agility, that sort of thing. And sometimes you see it on film and sometimes you see it, you know, at, at the combine. So like, yes, owners do that. Owners are not skilled at scouting. Like that's not their job. Their job is to sign the checks unless you're Jerry Jones. And then your job is to sign the checks and screw up everything <laughs> in, in terms of scouting and drafting and whatever. But the it's a very specific job. It, yeah. But, but like scouts still, Oh, like, and I'm not saying that college tape doesn't matter a lot. Like it does. Oh yeah. Sure. But they're also like, there are also the, the reason John Ross got pushed way up in the draft, the reason why Ruggs got pushed way up in the draft, it wasn't because of their college tape. It was because they went really fast. And and so it's not like a it's not like a binary thing. It's not one or the other, but they man, they do look at that. And like you see draft boards shift because of the combine, because guys are athletic or guys are fast. And and Right That's now, not, I think we're on the same page. Like, yeah, with the minute yeah. you're telling Zach the tape matters, like, <laughs> what he spends way too much time looking. Yeah, yeah, he agrees. Trust me. Um, the other part and, and of it, again, I would say, is I'm valuing the tape. Technically, I'm just looking at numbers that yeah. literally come from someone having counted the tape, and but I the, just can deal with that a bit better than watching. So, yeah, the tape is, I, I think, the best information we have outside the draft. And and that like his next point is yeah they crapped out at the NFL level but that's exactly my point is they're they're using things that don't actually matter like some like some of the scouting process is using stuff that doesn't actually matter on the football field you know it's it's the Jamie Moyer when Jamie Moyer threw for Seattle and he he couldn't break a pane of cla a glass with his fastball but he was getting major league hitters out like but. 
most scouts are not looking for Jamie Moore because more often it's the Uber athlete that's going to be the 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 productive player in the NFL. I mean, it's the same thing. Like if if we went through again and and Jerry Rice came out now, there's a real good chance he wouldn't be in the first, you know, five rounds of an NFL. It's the Puka Nakua thing. Like nobody drafted Puka Nakua because he didn't necessarily stand out. His film was fine. His athleticism was fine. Like there are things that set players apart. What? His production. Yeah, Antonio Brown. Same thing. He he had his he had like a four six two forty, like, and and so it's really difficult to say yes, this is the answer because if if we had the answer, everybody would be would be doing it. And so, and and again, this is and part of me is is I think back to me trying out for like I tried out for the Reds and the Pirates, and when I went to the try with the, with the Reds, I was throwing like eighty seven. And they, the, the scout was like, I threw four pitches at 87 miles an hour. And the guy was like, nah, I'm good. And I was like, you, I don't, that's it. And he was like, yeah, he's like, I, I appreciate you, but you don't throw hard enough. And I was like, cool. So like that sort of thing happens. I said something that tripped Alexa. All of a sudden, I had uh, Slim Slim Shady going to the background. I don't know what's going on. I think the point I make about these not out lower dra- things the NFL gets wrong. Most of them have either missed time playing in a weird conference, personal situations. That's a Debo Samo type thing. And um, but of the ones we have information about, or a significant element of college tape. Um, they're productive relative to the team's offense. One reason receiving us team pass attempt works for Antonio Brown and some others, but not always. Like, I think the main problem is everyone thinks they know or they're looking for a silver bullet. Instead, you just got to learn about where the target is a bit better and accept that some targets are not going to come into your view. Like, we just we can't reasonably expect to catch everyone that's actually better, and we probably have missed a bunch, and the NFL's missed a bunch, and we're gonna, bunch of players probably could have done really well just never had the chips land exactly where they needed to to show us and that's not okay but we play fantasy and the best thing we can do is learn as much about which targets we can actually hit relatively consistently and kind of throw all our chips in there it's not i need to look at this number or this series of college tape or just college tape it's all of it to learn where the best, tar- the most likely area your targets are going to be, and then take the best shots you can. Um, uh, I know that sounds boring because I'm not talking about a silver bullet. This, I'm going to cure this. I'm just going to try and be, f- and choose another metaphor, fishing in a richer pond more often than not. And when I find one from another pond, like it's Puka, I'm just going to willingly accept that instead of trying to disprove it. And like I, I got and, it wrong. Okay, I wasn't even looking over there. But now I know, and this happened to me with Waddle, especially considering my second look. The minute he proved he was better than his initial profile, I was like, okay, I'm going to rank him higher than everyone else. That's him. And, and and so Rain Man, your the next his next comment is just remember not to get too overblown over the combine. And we like we started the show <laughs> off with with this. And so like you you may not have been here, yeah. but like. We don't, I don't even factor in the combine unless I'm drafting in a league that drafts before the NFL draft. I don't care about the combine. I don't care about the numbers. I don't care about anything that happened at the combine because the NFL is going to tell me what mattered at the combine. The NFL draft capital is going to tell me what they think matters. And then I'll take my rankings of players and go, this guy got draft capital, but I'm not touching with him with a 10 foot pole. You know, this guy got draft capital and I liked him. So awesome. This guy didn't get draft capital. And I liked him. So I'm going to move him down because as Peter loves to say, the NFL likes the smell of their own farts. So if they take a guy high, he's going to get a lot of opportunity to fail or succeed. If a guy gets taken lower, they didn't invest as much. So they don't have as much incentive to, to give him the opportunity. So like he may earn it. I would say, but it's sorry. harder. No, no, it's your There's own. a counterpoint to that. Do I think they can throw too much on one player? 
I think some players who get who miss with good draft capital just had too much expected too soon. Like you yeah. do have longer to prove it, but you have to be they're also going to get tired of you pretty definitely. Like we spent it first on you, why aren't you great? It's because I need a little time, man. It's because I came from <laughs> came from UKIP or something. Uh, where if they had been drafted more appropriately, maybe they would have worked their way into being what they needed. But because you were drafted in the top 20 picks because I ran a good 40, I fail out. You know, I'm not saying I can hit on those players or even though I had a target, them, but I do wonder because there's a few players who are really productive in college. And when you talk to Zach or talk to some others, they've got some skills to their game, but yeah. and then they get higher draft capital than we think. I'm like, okay, that's interesting, but it actually. The results tend to be negative. Like there's a yeah. balance between the opportunity and the sm fart smelling is good, <laughs> but I mean Antonio Brown, Tyree Kill, a lot of these players also work into being the greatest ever, and yeah. I don't know that's part of it. But there are so few of them, and it turns up on so many of their pro uh, on their stories. You're like, may maybe that was helpful. Maybe and not being expected to be a first round pick straight away was a good thing. I don't yeah. know, but it is I, I an think... element of it. And to be clear here, Ray, man, we're still saying the same thing. I've li The only thing I said about the combine is the numbers are not actionable. Like, I don't right. overvalue the combine. I do not value it. I think right. it's interesting. I think it might be fun. I use it not at all. I collect the information because people want it, <laughs> and so I put it in my database. But I literally could care less. Maybe that I under I potentially undervalue it. I care about it so little. Um, yeah. And Anthony wants you to know he appreciated your point about the gauntlet. He also thinks it's interesting. Yeah, and, and and again, like it's it's not like you're not overvaluing the the combine. And to me, the combine is such a small sample size too. Like I would rather I like I, I watch between eight and sixteen games of all of the players that I do evaluations for. I would rather base my evaluation on that than than. Uh, four hours in India in their underwear, like that. It's just maybe that's me, but like that, I would rather base it on them playing and a and a bigger sample size of them playing over a longer span of time than, hey, this guy ran fast one day in Indianapolis, like in shorts. Yeah. Um, my elbow hurts just thinking thinking about throwing a ball. To be fair, Anthony, <laughs> oh, yeah, same page. You know, bring bring your glove to Canton this year, Peter. We'll play catch. It'll be great. It's a bad idea. <laughs> um, don't think I ever cleared seventy miles per hour, but it was never a pitcher. Again, probably couldn't throw the ball that far. <laughs> I think you're doing pretty good, Dave. Uh, Brown had good footage, bad combine, and. Especially from the sixth round. Again, the combat just does. Yeah. It's not. Actually. And yeah, I mean, it does matter it's for running backs way, more than say. quarterbacks and receivers, but there's no, there's literally no signal for receivers. Like none. There's zero signal. So, yes. I used to think that with running backs. One of my first articles was about how running backs and combine kind of matter because they have better thresholds, but they too, they just keep moving based on the players that hit each year. And because yeah. they can find somewhat common ranges, it's justified. <laughs> like the player who's closer to this bar on most of the tests is not necessarily the player that's closer to this bar on most of the tests. That, that like, it's, I still don't know it's effective. The only thing it's still relatively effective for, and I'm mad that Brock Bowers didn't run the 40 because of it, is tight end. And that's because tight end is such a small group. We have so little to go on that it's that low level thing kind of matters. And also because of the nature of the position, you do need to be a giant human who can move a little bit um, or, or a lot. So yeah, I'd go with it on tight end more than any other position. Uh, in fact, tight end's the only position it has marginal relevance for, from my nerdy fantasy perspective, you know? We made it. They're telling us it's too late. It is. Uh, I agree, though. I want to go to bed somewhat uh, before midnight or at midnight. Uh, at midnight would do. I mean, how was how was eleven fifty two? Look over there. Sounds good.